Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the first meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. The committee is invited to consider and agree whether to take agenda item three in private. Item three is consideration of evidence heard today in relation to the committee's budget scrutiny. Are we all agreed? Thank you. That is agreed. Um, the committee will take evidence today in the Scottish Government's budget for the financial year 2019-20 from representatives of COSLA and Solace Scotland, and then from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work, and the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government. For a first session, I welcome Councillor Gail McGregor, Spokesperson for Resources, and Vicky Bibby, Head of Resources COSLA, and Anne-Marie O'Donnell, uh, Chair of Solace Scotland. Sorry, Anne-Marie. Uh, I invite Councillor McGregor to make a brief opening statement. Um, firstly, I'd like to extend my thanks to the committee for their invitation to hear our evidence today um, on the draft budget 2019-2020. Obviously, with the Cabinet Secretary appearing before the committee in the session following this one, it's very important that the committee understands the impact that this settlement will have on our local authorities. Um, bluntly, the draft settlement as it is will impact jobs, frontline services and economic growth. It also puts at risk the national performance framework which we're co-signatories on. The draft budget sees a cash reduction at present to core revenue budgets of 237 million or 2.4% and a cash cut to the core capital budget of 17 million or 2%. Our figures may seem different to those generated by SPICE, but I want to provide a reassurance that our fig figures reconcile with theirs and we fully support and rec recognise the calculations made by SPICE. While our figures are in cash terms, SPICE figures are mostly presented in real terms. My colleague Vicky, Head of Resources for COSLA, is here to provide more detail on technical aspects like this today, if you would require. Regardless of the presentation of figures, what is clear is that, as announced, the draft budget will have a significant impact on Scottish councils, on our communities and on the inclusive growth across Scotland. Since 2011-12, local government budgets have decreased significantly and the rate of those cuts has been disproportionate to the decrease in the Scottish government revenue budget. Since 2013-14, the Scottish government revenue budget has fallen by less than 1%, while local government revenue budgets have fallen by more than 7%. At the same time, the ability of councils to raise money locally has been constrained, first by a freeze on council tax and now by a cap. Scottish councils are at the mercy of Scottish government and the decisions over the revenue we will get and the limited fiscal options that are open to us. I believe that councils have done all they can to make efficiencies and protect services, and Anne-Marie may touch on some of that later as well. There's now nowhere else for local government to go. The cumulative impact of continuous budgetary pressure will, with demands on local services are continuing to grow. While the Scottish Government have increased the level of initiatives councils are expected to deliver, and this has led to a situation where the core is simply crumbling. Councils have been doing more with less and have achieved great innovations and efficiencies, but the challenges brought by the current draft budget will cause fundamental considerations of the services being provided. We have moved beyond a streamlining and an efficiency agenda. The effect of the settlement also brings the success of, an, of the national performance framework into consideration. COSLA is a co-signatory and this is under threat. Local authorities deliver over 60% of the outcomes of the MPF, but the current level of settlement and the structure of the budget means cuts will be forced from the areas which make the aspirations of the MPF a reality. I'm sure that we'll discuss these issues in more detail throughout the session this morning, and Anne-Marie O'Donnell, representing Solace today, will be able to give an insight into the difficult decisions which councils are currently making as they prepare their 1920 budgets. I know that some of these issues were touched on in the committee's pre-budget scrutiny, which COSLA has welcomed. As budget scrutiny moves forward in the new year round, I would urge the committee not to forget the interrelationship between all services a council provides. The level and the structure of the local government budget puts the council's foundations at significant risk, which in turn risks achieving the ambitions we all share for the communities across Scotland and for inclusive economic growth. And we'd be very happy to take any questions from the committee today. Thank you. 
OK, thank you very much for that. Can I ask you, um, around the dis dis discrepancy between the two figures, do you accept, that, for example, that social care, education, early learning, childcare, housing are all core services all that have to be delivered by local authorities? I accept absolutely that they are all core services. Um, the, the difficulty that we have is that we have some commitments already within the core, such as early learning and childcare. We're currently delivering 600 hours, and that money is now sitting in our core. Um, we then have Scottish Government priorities, which are excellent priorities. They're the priorities that we support, but they require additional funding. So, for instance, this year, the expansion to 1140 hours for early learning and childcare is a headline figure in, in Mr Mackay's budget, and we welcome that additional funding. Um, but if we can't maintain the core, we can't continue to deliver the 600 hours and expand. And I, th I think the key is that um, Scottish Government priorities must come fully funded, but not at the expense of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Surely, if, if you take the early years, for example, and you're, you're receiving the funding you just talked about for early years, and that is part of your core, then you're receiving money for your core services. We're receiving money for our core services, and we're also receiving additional money. The problem comes that... Um, the £400, uh, £400 million pounds worth of additional commitments, which are, which are Scottish Government priorities and policies, and as I say, we fully support them, we're, we're joined up in partnership to deliver them. When we reach the stage where we have £237 million cut out of our budget, that £237 million has to come from 42% of our core budget, which is not ring-fenced and, and not protected. So you know, the budget saving that we have to find doesn't just affect 100% of the budget, it actually affects a very small part of the budget. So the £237 million, which is the, the estimated shortfall that we have at the moment, can only be taken from 42% of the budget. The 400 million that has been given for the new initiatives absolutely will be spent on those new initiatives, and quite rightly so, but it will be at the expense of something else. So, uh, can you explain to me then, you, you talk about a 237 million pound shortfall, the Scottish Government and the figures from Spice say that there's, uh, there's an increase in, in real terms, so, and the cash terms, so can you explain that discrepancy for, to me? I'll defer to Vicky, who's the, the technical finance expert, if that's OK. okay. Um, um, come on. So what we're saying is, what, when we're saying there's a cash cut of £237 million, we are comparing a like for like of what services you um, have to provide. So as Councillor McGregor says, there is an increase overall in the settlement, but that is to deliver £400 million of new commitments. There's not a £400 million pound increase on the cash basis. And coming back to your early years point, it's quite a critical point. The ring-fenced additional funding, which is to be fully funded, takes you from the existing 600 hours to the 1140 hours. That's, as Councillor McGregor says, is the 234 million. But the um, existing provision, which is the 600 hours, is in the core budget, and that is being cut. Um, so that's why we've got this... The, uh, the local government settlement is becoming increasingly complex, but the only bit that is being fully funded is taking you from 600 to 1140. The 0 to 600 provision is in the core settlement, which is being cut. And so if you look at it overall, you can't say that early years is being fully funded. Well, <laughs> you're right, it's very complicated, and I, and I don't want to go into too much of that stuff because I think we'd all get lost. But surely if, if there's extra money going into the early years funding then there's extra money going into early years funding, and that's got to benefit from... You can't get to 1140 without getting to 600. So surely that money has to be fed into the whole process. Yes, hypothetically. So the additional funding allows us to expand C1140, which is a commitment that we've signed up to with government. Absolutely support that. However, the core funding that delivers what we're already doing, which is up to the 600 hours, is now subject to potentially up to 6% of budget cuts. Um, the 2.4% of budget cuts across the entire budget is bad enough. But as I say, because we have 42% of the budget at core, which is the only area that we can touch because it's either... Um, non-statutory, non-protected or non-ring-fenced, your 600 hours technically sit within that. Um, so you know, what our aspiration is to continue to deliver and to expand, of course it is, but it will be at the expense of something else within the council. Um, you know, when we're having to take savings at the core to, to, to expand and, and deliver new Scottish Government priorities, there is always going to be something else that takes the hit.
the priorities are the, a part of government, of course, aren't they? The part of decision-making, council, gov local government, or, or national government priorities are always the case of that. Uh, just, just very briefly, Alec, before I just, let you come in, very briefly. Uh, can I ask, did COSLA ask for additional funding for social care when they were in discussions with the government? Yes, um, we asked for a, a fairly significant amount of, of funding for health and social care. It's a very important area. Um, we know that COS, you know, COSLA and local government understand clearly that our role in delivering health is not just the NHS. Local government has a massive role in that. And I have to say that the Cabinet Secretary was incredibly um, helpful and, and his ear was very much open to additional funding for social care and I thank him for that. Um, I thank him that that we did that he has provided additional funding for Frank's law and all the other areas within social care and, and we are grateful for that. However, the additional funding is coming at the expense of the court. So I, I think it's the reality check that in negotiations, um, when people listen and they understand what our priorities are and what their priorities are and they meet, and we can come to an agreement on that, that is hugely welcome, and I do thank him for that. However, it will be at the expense of something within that 42% in the core budget, and that's the difficulty that local government has to balance now. OK, Alec, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I'll pick up on that point in IGBs, but in terms of... I mean, what do we do to, to, to when, when professionals start talking about something being so complex that it's difficult to understand? I think the public shut off. But, but you know, the example I would give is that the Scottish government say that the education budget is being increased. But when it comes down to in Fife, for example, where this year parent councils are now fighting four million pounds of cuts in their actual schools. Uh, that's that's where it's no complex for the parents and the, the pupils. They're seeing the cuts, the real term cuts taking place in their schools. So my first question would be, is COSLA going to do some work to highlight the impact of these cuts? So this year you're talking about 200 odd million pounds. Are you intend to do some work to highlight what, how that's impacting on services? Have you produced any work around that? And then in terms of the IGBs, has there been discussions in terms of the money that's going to go in through the NHS? Because the additional money that came from the Westminster uh, settlement, I understand that Derek Mackay is saying that's going to go directly into the NHS. Is that going into the IGBs? And do you believe that there's enough transparency around how the IGBs are being funded? Because again, there seems to be this, this argument that it's so complex, people just can't understand that. And is that really acceptable? There's quite a few points in there, and I'll, I'll let Vicky pick up on a few of the technical aspects. Um, I, I think in relation to education funding, for instance, obviously local councils make local decisions, particu particularly in relation to any budget savings within education. One of the big challenges sort of coming away from the ring fencing of the early learning and childcare and such like is that we do have an awful lot of government initiatives again which are out with the settlements such as the, the attainment fund um, and um, PEF funding, pupil equity fund. Now this is money that local government doesn't have any overview of so it can't apply it strategically across its entire estate or, it, or its individual schools. And I, I think that while education funding may be increasing, it's because there's, there's additional funding coming from out with the settlement which local government has no say over and can't apply fairly across the piece. And again, it, it doesn't allow gov local government to plan um, that the person, the pupil equity funding which goes into schools is controlled by the head teacher under, under sort of strict regulation from government, but it doesn't allow the local council to, to apply that funding in a more strategic long-term fashion. So while the education budget may appear to be going up, it's not necessarily within the control of local government. And, and I think that that's a fairly clear picture that there's an awful lot more centralisation and a lot more um, local democracy and local decision-making being taken away. And I think that that's a problem. And it's certainly something that we are tracking and monitoring. Obviously, at the moment, local councils are currently developing their budgets. They're, they're, they're very keeping them very close to their chests for the majority of them, so we're not really sure of what areas they're looking at. But as we go through the budget process, we'll certainly start to extrapolate some of that data and see where the, the axe is falling. Vicky, do you want to pick up on IGBs? 
Well, it was just on the, the, my comment on the complexity. I think the complexity is in that at the high level, yes, you can see that local government budget is increasing at a purest um, high level, but the complexity is that you're asked to um, provide 400 million more services for that, and that's the complexity, which actually, as we we're pointing out, results in a 237 million cut. If we were required to deliver what we're delivering in um, 1819 and 1920, there is a um, 237 um, million cut. Um, the money for um, IGBs, we welcome the fact that it's rooted through um, the local government settlement. Um, but um, to, ha to have that transparency for local government in the broader sense that um, health is not just provided by the NHS. The complexity around that, though, is in the local government circular. Um, local government is asked to pass on that £120 million to the IGBs and maintain existing funding um, on um, health and social care at the 18-19 um, level, which is um, what everybody would want to do. But it begs the question is, where do you take that two hundred? 37 million cut from because if you can't take it from anywhere on health and social care you can't take it from early years and you can't take it from teachers um, education because you've got the teacher numbers commitment it begs the question which is what local government will be struggling with is where do we um, account for this 237 million cut on top of all the significant pressures, inflationary pressures such as pay um, awards that councils are wrestling with. And, and that's just what we're seeing is the budget reality. It's a difficult settlement. Uh, Graham, then Kenny, then Annabel. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I, I think members of the public will, will be completely baffled by, by all this. Um, when they see uh, an overall increase uh, in the budget settlement for local government and then every single council in Scotland is probably going to turn around and say we're having to make cuts and people would just be scratching their heads at that. Um, so per perhaps a, a, a bit more of an explanation for anyone watching as to why when your budget's going up you're having to make cuts. Um, and, and perhaps you could tell us also which areas, if we accept there are going to be cuts, which areas are likely to face cuts? I'm not asking you to drill down council by council because you don't know that, but you could spell out the areas of spending that might be affected. Absolutely. Um, Cabinet Minister suggested that there was a £210 million increase in, in our budget. Now, if you factor in the £400 million worth of new commitments, that means that local government is starting with a deficit of £190 million. Uh, 190 million. That is just fact. So, so people out there in the public have to understand that uh, as an absolute base, we have a £190 million cut to our budget. Now, we have some fantastic new initiatives that will be of benefit to the public, and, and they will see that benefit, but it will be at a cost to other things that are incredibly important to them. And as Vicky's highlighted, there are areas which we simply cannot take any savings from. So the reality is that, particularly when you're talking about health and wellbeing agendas, we all know that our leisure centres, that our libraries, that our community centres provide um, facilities and, and the ability for people living in isolation with loneliness, with p potentially mental health issues, um, that the opportunity to socialise, to, to integrate and to have somewhere to go. Within the 42% that I was talking about earlier on, which is our non-protected part of the budget or the non-statutory part, although libraries are statutory, but it, it doesn't state how you have to deliver a library service, the reality is that things like your road service, um, so day-to-day -day people trying to get around the area and bumping through potholes, uh, that road's that road service could be cut. That could be part of the 6% cut to the 42%. Your leisure and culture, your leisure and sport, um, you, you, increases in fees and charges for leisure and sports, things that do directly impact people, particularly people from more disadvantaged backgrounds, your parks and open spaces, um, third sector funding, which deliver a massive amount of incredibly valuable um, support to people in our communities, employability support. I mean, uh, local government and councils, uh, along with the, the cabinet minister, are trying to look at ways to, to bolster our economy, to create more jobs in our environment, 
environment in our local areas. Um, but obviously, if we're having to cut our employability and skills areas within local councils, that makes that more difficult to deliver. And as I say, things like your libraries and your community centres, the very things that, that people rely on day to day and actually have taken for granted probably for quite a long time, um, we're beginning to see uh, a, a slight cut back in their opening hours in what they're able to deliver. And I think that the reality is that people haven't noticed until now, but going forward with the settlement as it is, people are going to begin to notice. And that is the reality on the ground for folk. Hopefully, it will never affect things like home care, looking after granny at home. However, that there are areas that are already protected, which do need more investment in, because we, we, we know the budgetary pressures and the demand going forward as well. So it's a massive balancing act. Massive balancing act. You want okay. to go? Thank you. I mean, I, I, I think, um, speaking as a former councillor, um, probably people on the ground haven't really noticed this yet. But your, your argument is we're at a point that they're going to start to notice. Libraries are going to start to close. Well, they already have started to close. Um, fees and charges going up even, even more. And if the roads budget gets cut, I mean, we're, sit we're in a city here, which is a series of potholes and bits of road in between. Um, it, it's just going to get even worse. And the pe people are going to be furious about this. Is that, I presume you'd agree with that? I would entirely agree with that, yes. Can I, sorry, can I just come in on this point? You, you mentioned libraries and, and home cares, but you said, and you mentioned libraries a couple of times there, but you also said that libraries was, were statutory and, and therefore they were, you were going to have to continue to keep that service. Now, libraries have been closing for some time and moving into local colleges and, and local uh, other local facilities, so there's nothing new in that. There's nothing to suggest that that's coming about because of this budget or because of any previous budgets. It's, it's a decision that local authorities seem to have made as part of a, a rationalisation uh, process. And also when you talk about home care, if there are cuts in home care, do you accept that that would be because the local authority decided that that's where they should make the cuts as opposed to somewhere else? I think in respect of libraries, you're, you're absolutely correct, as I said, it is a statutory service. What is not um, explicit is how that service is delivered. So to put it bluntly, you, you could deliver a book out the back of a van and that could be a library service. Um, but, well, absolutely, yeah. Um, I think the reality is that councils over... I mean, I've been a councillor for 11 years. I've not had one budget in that 11-year period where we haven't taken budget savings. So I, I think it's a long-term trickle effect. Yes, we have been amalgamating libraries into customer service centres. We've, we've had transformational change. We've had change across our entire estate to make savings and to make a more efficient service, more importantly. We're now reaching a stage where we've done all that. We can't do that twice. So we're now having to look at a decrease in opening hours or a, a relaxation of particular services within that community centre or within the amalgamated service. I made no indication that we were going to cut home care budgets. Absolutely. I, I suspect that every council in Scotland, it would be the last budget they would cut. We totally understand the value of that. The point I was trying to make is that, um, along with the teaching profession, we have a recruitment and a retention crisis in care at home in particular. We're very aware of that. We're aware that it holds up hospital, um, people coming out of hospital and being able to go back into their own homes. And I think as local government and, uh, and as COSLA, we have to, and with government, I think crucially um, with Ms Freeman and, and Mr Mackay, we have to have a big discussion about how we deliver care at home going forward and what we do to incentivise people into that particular profession, how we recruit them and how we retain them. But that is going to come at a cost. You know, so, so what we're delivering at the moment is good, but we need to be delivering better. And, the, and, you know, and, and going forward with demand, I think we have about a 3.8% demand on social care on a th £3.4 billion budget. It's a massive demand. And I think if we don't address that going forward with Scottish Government, we are going to have a care at home crisis. So we're not just looking at what we're doing now, we're looking at what we're doing next year, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, um, to protect the most vulnerable in our communities. So no indication that we will ever cut home care budgets. Thank you for the clarification, no Kenny. Yeah, firstly, on the figures, um, do these figures that you're presenting, uh, are they prior to a, a possible council tax increase of 3%? Okay, uh, so if council tax is up to 3%, which is likely, and I would imagine the majority of local authorities, that's significantly reduced that gap. 
Um, well, I mean, assuming we accept what you've said in terms of the, the, re the real terms reduction in local government funding over the last years, I don't think it's quite the 60% we've seen south of the border. But even so, I, I think it's fair to say the reductions have been higher in Scotland than they have, uh, sorry, they've been higher in um, local government than in uh, the Scottish government generally, which is what you've said. But surely that's because the Scottish Government has prioritised the NHS. So do you believe that in order to achieve kind of parity, if you like, in that regard, um, money should be shifted from the NHS or transport or justice? This additional funding that you're asking for, where should it come from? Because when I look through your, your document, that's one thing that seemed to be lacking. Uh, how should the Government actually fund this? Raise taxes or should it come from other uh, parts of the Scottish budget? Mm -hmm. Um, it's way above my pay grade to tell the Cabinet Secretary <laughs> how he funds uh, services. I, I think the reality is that, as we've seen, um, Scottish National Heritage, SEPA, other agencies, uh, NHS and such like, have had a much less reduction than local government. I think local government sits at the higher end of that scale. Um, and, and I think that we've possibly been a little bit of an easy hit in the past and say, I'm not going to dictate how budgets should be spent and where it should be spent. And I'm certainly not going to pit local government against the NHS. They're both um, equally valuable. I think the reality is that we need to have more flexibility in what we can raise ourselves. Um, I completely appreciate the, the position that we're in where the, the lion's share of the funding that has come from Westminster has gone to the NHS. I, you know, I understand why it has. Um, I would hope that some of that funding through the integrated joint boards will filter down to local government because I think that people need to understand the role that local government plays in the delivery of health out outcomes. Um, but I think, crucially, that the levers to raise more money locally would assist us. The, the cap on council tax, um, when it was first put in place, inflation was only sitting at 1%. We're now sitting over 3% in terms of inflation. So uh, you, the council tax cap has not been particularly helpful. It's not enabled us to raise additional funding. Um, and, and I think we do have a reality check. We know that government can't give us all the funding, and we appreciate that, but we know we, nor do we have the levers to do an awful lot locally. Uh, and we perhaps need a wider reform of local taxation in general. So when you say levers, you mean um, taxing people more locally, effectively, because of... I mean, I think, to be blunt, if it's a bit of a copper, I think, to come and say, oh, we're hundreds of millions of pounds short, blah, 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 but you're not giving us any idea of how much extra should the Scottish Government should give directly and where that should come from in a budget which is limited. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, we don't have powers for... You know, we can't borrow billions like south of the border. You know, we can't run a £1.8 trillion pound debt. We can't um, raise money from fuel tax and from alcohol and VAT, etc. So we have limits in how we can actually raise funds. But what you're effectively saying is, if you, if you are suggesting that we don't touch other budgets, such as the NHS and others that I've mentioned, then we have to bleed the taxpayer, the ordinary householder, um, you've already suggested we get rid of council tax uh, caps, which means, uh, I imagine, uh, uh, inflation plus um, uh, um, hits on people. So, uh, you know, can you explain where the, what these levers in more detail would raise and how they would raise it and how much people would actually be expected to pay? Yeah. Nobody wants to tax people more, but we know that, and, and certainly not at local level. But I think local councils are very good at consulting with the people that they represent and that they look after. Um, and I think there is an acknowledgement out there that people would be willing to pay a little bit more locally if they were to see the benefit of that being spent locally. So, for example, the 3% council tax that we have at the moment raises around £80 million. Pounds. Now, an additional 3% would take us to 160. We're beginning to close the gap on the deficit that we currently have. Um, but again, it would be down to individuals to, to make those decisions locally. It would be down to individual councils to make those decisions in consultation with the public. Now, some members of the public might like to see some services taken away and not pay more, but it would be done in consultation. I think the fundamental point is that we should have, whether we use it or not, the ability to raise more money locally, to, to invest in local priorities, should we choose. It's not about having a carte blanche, everybody's going to apply a council tax rate over inflation plus three. It's having the ability and the principle that local governments should be able to make local choices. If the Scottish Government was to back off and say, look, you've got your grant settlement, because we've made these choices, 
and we're not willing to change them. Okay, they might be a wee bit of tinkering around the edges and a few million here and a few million there, but generally speaking, if local government wants to raise more money, um, they have to raise that. Do you think that, uh, you know, that A, the Scottish Government, and B, local authorities be thanked for that by the people who'd be expected to pay this? And would it not, would the same political parties who are asking for this not be the same ones who would criticise teacher numbers? Because one of the reasons the Scottish Government brought in um, you, you know, mean, uh, the, the policy of maintaining teacher numbers was because teacher numbers were being cut quite significantly. And then the same parties who were in power at local authority level cutting them were then turning up at the Scottish Parliament and denouncing the Scottish Government for it, who were not then directly in charge because it was the local authorities that were dealing with it. So how do, how do you square that actual circle, you know, um, in terms of you know, the Scottish Government delivering these responsibilities to local authorities, the local responsibilities, and, and, and then imposing them. Because it's, uh, it's, it's people will come to the, their MSPs and say, oh, my council tax has doubled. And we might say, oh, well, that's up to the council. You know, I mean, yeah. how, you know, how, how do you actually deliver this? I think the, the, the difficulty is that we're in a situation whereby there's not enough money, frankly, uh, to go around and difficult decisions are being made. And I think even if local government was to get these additional powers, I think the burden on individual households would be such that there would be real unrest among uh, um, among uh, among the public, unless they saw a miraculous improvement in local services. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not here to make any political comment on what local individual local councils do. I represent 32 local author authorities fairly um, uh, and across the piece. Uh, I think the reality is that we, we could turn it around. We, we, we could say, well, local co local councils would love to deliver you new priorities. But if they aren't properly funded and the core isn't properly funded, please tell us which ones you don't want us to deliver. Um, so I, I think there's, there's an element of faith between government and local government that we're willing to deliver on new priorities, as you say, which government quite rightly brings in. But a lot of the restrictions that are put around that funding makes it very difficult for local government to make local decisions. So, um, for instance, the, 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 the social care funding that we had last year, we didn't have a ring fence around that. Mr Mackay allowed it to just go straight into councils, not into the IJBs, and for local councils to make decisions around that. And as I've said to Mr Dornan, of course we weren't going to cut the social care funding and take it away from who needs it, but having that trust and that principle of being able to maybe via it somewhere else if that is deemed more important at that time, is incredibly important. So, uh, you yeah, know, I would almost turn it back that local government wants to deliver these fantastic priorities that government brings to us, because they are good priorities. But if they aren't fully funded and they're going to come at the expense of something else that local councils think is equally important, I would ask government, which one of these do you not want us to deliver? Because that's the territory we're starting to get into now. We're starting to get to a level where the budget saving or the, the budget cut is such that we either don't continue to deliver some of our very crucial core services or we don't deliver some of the new priorities. And, and that's, a bit, that's a big break of partnership with government. So I don't want to do that, but the, the, that's the reality. Well, just, just the last point. They'll just say uh, efficiencies, obviously, which is obviously an easy thing for governments to say, but they'll look at the 7% real terms cut that you've mentioned in Scotland in the last decade and compare it to the 60% cut that's south of the border and say, well, hold on a second, you know, local authorities have not collapsed south of the border. I know some of them are in very severe financial trouble. Obviously, nobody wants to see that level of cut here. Absolutely nobody wants to see that. But So, th so that's what they'll look at, and they'll say, that, you know, if there's a 1% or 2% reduction in some core services, while we're providing additional money to provide really important new priorities, then that's something that, given the financial structures on the local government, the money available to it, that's something the local government will, unfortunately, have to live with. I'll take that as a comment rather than a question. OK, thank you. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. OK, okay. Annabelle, would you like to come in and then Andy and then get Alexander? OK, uh, thank you and good morning. Um, just before I had a couple of questions, but just picking up on a point that Councillor McGregor made earlier in the discussion on, on education funding, I note that Councillor McGregor accepts that education funding is increasing. Uh, and you, made, you went on to make the point that, um, in your view, uh, there was more centralisation. But I, I just wonder, how does that square with the... the actual mechanics of, for example, the pupil equity premium, where my understanding is that it, it couldn't be more local decision making, it's a local head teacher that, uh, you know, in accordance with, you know, the, the regulations that you refer to, takes the decision. Is that not getting really, really local so that the local head teacher who knows what's going on in their school is the one driving these decisions? How does that equate to centralisation? 
I completely understand your perspective and I would agree with it to a point. However, local councils have been devolving power to head teachers for a number of years now, in part because of budget savings. We've had to we've had to allow our head teachers to make more local decisions. And the pupil equity funding which is going into schools is controlled directly by the head teacher and the staff within that school, um, which is no bad thing. The difficulty comes when it is sitting separately to the policies and the strategies that local councils have to deliver education within that school or within that area. So we then have an issue where we, we have additional funding going in for, for staff or for incentives within that school, which doesn't sit within the, the wider local government long-term plan for education. Um, so, so it suddenly is no longer strategic. It becomes a sticking plaster, and it doesn't necessarily align with that the priorities for, for, for health and well-being, for good mental health, that the local government or the local council will have, it just becomes a very individual issue within that school. And, and I think the reporting mechanism back is very complicated as well. Local councils don't necessarily understand what that pupil equity funding is being used for within the local area and how it sort of ties in with those councils' priorities. So while the, the funding is valuable, I think we're reaching a stage sort of two, three years in, we're now into the third year of that funding, where many members of staff will now be on permanent contracts. We don't know if that funding is going to extend beyond the, the end of this parliament. At what point do schools have to wind down what, is, what that particular funding is being used for it, you know, in the view that it may not continue. So I, I do wonder that the value is good when it's there, but because it's not strategic, because it's not embedded within the core business of the council, does it have longevity and does it have absolute value? And, and can we guarantee it in two years' time? And Or is that member of staff going to be ripped out of that school at, to the detriment of the child? Um, so I think if the funding had been given to local councils to apply... In a, you know, as I say, we've been devolving to head teachers anyway. We've given them a lot more power. But if the funding had been given directly to local councils, it could have been used in a more strategic way with a better long-term plan rather than just a, a very nice sticking plaster, as, I, you know, as, as many would see it. Bluntly. Well, well, I hear what you say. I, I, you know, in terms of long-term planning, I mean, issues would arise as regards long-term planning for any uh, organisation because no budgets are certain you know, beyond... Uh, a certain period of time um, but you know I would have thought one solution to, to the aligning you know strategic objectives of a local authority and so forth would be actually to work more closely with local head teachers and staff and that might help to to, to solve that problem but picking up on, on a couple of wider issues um, so I had understood that the overall share of uh, on the part of local government in terms of the overall Scottish budget uh, is effectively the same this year in this year's draft budget as last year's budget. Is, is that your view? Vicky, do you want to pick up on that? Um, yes, it is, but only through providing new services. And okay, that's but it the is critical point. Your but view that it is the same, it's the same share. So we're kind of getting it, back into that. Well, if you take it at the high level cash terms, yes, with the 400 million additional services with, to provide, the share is the same. But if you take it on a like for like, mm -hmm core budget it would have reduced yeah except as we've already heard you know the core budget includes what the core budget includes and that are all the things that we've discussed social care uh, early learning and so forth but not perhaps to, to reopen that debate um, my other question at this stage would be um, uh, you know and, and my colleague Kenny Gibson alluded to this um, you know obviously the, the Scottish budget is, budget is still predominantly uh, governed by the Barnett formula. So we have our position here in Scotland as far as local government settlements are concerned and we can look to see what's happening south of the border. Now, uh, Kenny Gibson referred to uh, cuts of 60% of uh, uh, south of the border, but in fact, the local government association, in terms of their figures, they cite the figure of reductions in uh, central government funding to local government in England of 77% from... 2015-16 to 2019-2020. So I'm assuming that COSLA would not be seeking to have a, a settlement offer of the kind that is being offered to local authorities south of the border of 77% cuts since 2015-16. No, but councils are collapsing in England and Wales and, and, and that's evident. And, and I think the reality as well is, no, absolutely, we wouldn't want that level of, of cut to Scottish budgets. 
increase in the overall However, funding from the centre to local government is actually, in that context, uh, really quite remarkable, I would mm -hmm. have thought, if we look to see what is happening south of the border, mm -hmm. uh, notwithstanding the financial constraints that operate on our raising uh, uh, income in, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. I'm no expert on local councils in England and Wales, but I know they have a very different structure and a very different system to the structures in Scotland. Um, they have an awful lot more local control and they have a lot more ability to raise income locally. So uh, I, I don't think we're comparing apples for pears. But I understand your principle. Um, I, 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 I'm I get not what going to you do say that the any comparison, the so, sorry to interrupt, but any comparison, you know, it, it will not perhaps always be exactly matched. No. However, I think it is fair and I think members of the public would accept that looking at the situation in England where there's a 77% reduction in 2015-16 to the end of 2020, and looking at the position in Scotland where we have still uh, uh, found uh, an overall uh, real terms increase of 2%, I think you know, that is a kind of broad brush comparison that members of the public actually would kind of get, um, notwithstanding the difficulties facing local authorities and all the rest of it in Scotland. That, you know, that is quite a, a stark contrast, shall we say, if not a direct comparison. Thank you. Um, oh, it, sorry. It, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's very different. The situation in England um, down south that's happened over a few years, I don't think anybody um, in local government or Scottish government would want to replicate what's happened in a number of councils. We've, um, in Scotland, thankfully, taken quite a different approach. We've co-signed the um, national performance framework and we've got this priority of um, inclusive growth. So we're wanting to avoid um, the stripping back of councils. I mean, the councils down south have moved to much more powers around non-domestic rates powers around um, local taxation which we would actually um, have asked and we would like to explore the benefits of that to change um, that dynamic in terms of um, the more local fiscal empowerment um, but certainly I think um, we've got a shared agreement with Scottish Government uh, that um, what's happened in England is not something we would want to for the benefit of all our communities replicate up in Scotland Okay, thank you very much, much. Andy and then I'm going to uh, thanks very much, Convener. Thank you for uh, coming in today. Just looking at the um, uh, the letter that went to Chief Executives and Directors of Finance on the 17th of December um, about the Local Government Finance Settlement, it says that this provisional total funding allocation forms the basis for the annual consultation between Scottish Government and COSLA ahead of the Local Government Finance Order. Uh, it says in paragraph 4 that the terms of the settlement have been negotiated through COSLA on behalf of all 32 of its member councils. What does that mean? <laughs> You're referring to the circular? Yeah. I'm referring to the, uh, the draft circular, finance circular 8, 2018 of 17th December. I suppose they've been negotiated. They haven't been agreed. I think the, 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 there's a difference between the two. Um, yes, we have been in ongoing negotiations, and I lead on those negotiations on behalf of 32 local authorities. Um, so that is... Sorry? Yes, but we're not agreed Yeah, on the but we've not agreed the settlement. I, I, I think the difficulty is that with budget process, as you know, and with a minority government, um, I, I go so far with government, and then other wheels start to go into motion. Um, which makes it very difficult for local government. Um, so, yes, we have been in negotiation on behalf of 32 local authorities, but through the, the new year budget process, there's now more work to be done. But, but it says have been negotiated through COSLA. That does imply that COSLA has agreed this, I mean, has negotiated. What does that really mean? What's the difference between your understanding of the outcome of those negotiations and the, the, the circular. I don't know, you're playing semantics with me. COSA doesn't agree the wording of no. the circular. Um, okay, we'll, and we'll leave COSA it. leaders have not agreed the local government settlement. Right, we'll, we'll, leave, it, we'll, we'll leave it there mm -hmm. um, on that. In paragraph five, it gives you all the conditions which all 32 councils must agree with to get the £11.1 billion full funding package that's talked about. Now, in years gone by, COSLA has, on behalf of 32 councils, agreed this. Um, given that in paragraph 21 to 24 of your own submission, you talk about a reducing amount of 
core funding, and you're talking about more centralisation, so um, the element of local government revenue over which local governments have control is reduced from 98% to 88%. So essentially, central government saying, here's the money, but you've got to do this with it. And that's reflected in part in paragraph five. Um, have there been any discussions about whether you, you shall accept this or not? It will be down to individual local councils to make that decision locally. Uh, it's not down to COSLA as a body to, to make an overarching decision. Um, it, discussions within COSLA about whether councils will accept this or not? No, not yet. That, that meeting will come on, on the 25th of January. OK, thanks very much. Um, I just want to look at the kind of long-term outlook. Um, you say councils obviously haven't been setting their budget yet and you're not cited on some of their, uh, on their budgets. Um, but they have been making, they have publicly stated the kind of savings that they're looking to make and consultations have been underway and the public have been in discussions about 3% cut or, 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 or whatever. What's your understanding about the difference between the kind of projections we've seen and the reality that is coming forward in this draft budget? I, I think it's worse on the ground than, than people would anticipate. I, I think that the, the initial feeling um, with the draft budget was that it, it wasn't a great budget, but they didn't understand the implications at that point. I think the reality now is that many councils are looking at um, when you factor in pay inflation, demand pressure and, and other things which should be factored into any budget um, with the saving on top of that that it's actually looking quite dark for many councils particularly those who don't who don't have significant reserves uh, and I think that that position is not going to shift at this time and councils have got very very difficult decisions to make so uh, we, 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 I think many were looking at a reduced settlement um, at the beginning, mid-December, who are now looking at, as I say, up to 6% coming out of certain areas of the budget. And I think that that's a very difficult position for councils to be in and very hard decisions for councillors to make. And I think this, this is another thing, reason why um, national priorities and government priorities cause problems for, for local councils, as you're very aware. Um, the, in the programme for government this year, there was uh, additional funding coming through for school councillors and for school nurses. There's a big discussion at the moment about music instruction. All very valuable things, but all things which local councils have had to, in the past few years, have made really, really tough decisions to um, take out of the service to protect things like teacher numbers. So I, I think we're in a very difficult decision now as well. We've got very difficult decisions ahead in that we have national um, policies on things like school councillors coming back to local councils when we've already taken those out of schools in the past. So I, I think that that centralisation agenda, again, is very difficult for local councils. Really, ideally, we should be given a, a, a reasonable settlement with additional funding for new priorities and be allowed pretty much to deliver what is essential in our local areas without too much intervention. In, in terms of members of the public, um, your constituents, my constituents, um, they want to have a little bit of clarity about how much money is available, what it's being spent on, and who's accountable for making those decisions. So in earlier conversations, we talked about the extension of early learning and childcare to 1140 hours and how that extension is fully funded over the current base of 600, but the 600 comes out of your core and your core is being cut. If that 600, for the sake of argument, in a council is cut to 500, let's say, so there's not an extension to 1140, there's only an extension to 1040. Who's responsible for that? Because the constituent that comes to me and complains that the 1140 is not being delivered as the government promised and I hold the government to account uh, will we'll have a legitimate grievance. But the constituent that comes to the council and saying you've got all this money, you've been, we, I've been told you have this money for them. Is, is there a fundamental problem here about the accountability of money? Because irrespective of the sums, it seems to me that the public d deserve clarity on who is responsible for making funding decisions and funding commitments. And in that context, would you welcome a fiscal framework that sets out the rules 
about local government funding in a clearer way <laughs> so that we can be very clear about who is responsible for what, what and who should be held accountable for decisions over funding. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think that that would be the, the ideal long-term goal and, and I think it would be essential. Um, I think early learning childcare is a very, very good example of partnership working between government and local government. We put together the framework for how that would be delivered and expanded. Um, we put together the funding package in partnership. I think it was probably fairly unique in its formation. And, and, uh, and I think that that's been groundbreaking and probably should pave the way for how we manage other government priorities coming forward. It must be done in, in partnership and in conjunction with local authorities. But you're absolutely right. Once you get to the grassroots delivery of that service, the, the, the buck kind of stops with the council because that's the face of the delivery of your child going into that nursery for X amount of hours per week. And, and I think that there needs to be a greater understanding that if that is not fully funded or if it is fully funded but has consequences elsewhere, that responsibility lies with government. But as you say, in, invariably, it's the parent that will come into the, the director of education and say, why is my child not getting what you promised they were going to be getting? Um, so I think a, a much more transparent fiscal process and framework would be absolutely welcome. Do you have more to add to that? It's one of your aspirations. <laughs> um, I, I think, well, we've asked for, um, to do some cross-party work um, to just have that greater transparency around the local government settlement to have it on a more sustainable footing um, going forward. Um, the majority of the settlement, um, we are um, relying, and we've had annual budgets, um, over the last few years um, purely on what the local government, um, Scottish government gives local government with that um, flexibility of only 3% on the council tax with the cap. But Anne-Marie would probably be able to describe what actually that means on the ground. Yeah, I mean, certainly speaking with um, um, specifically on early learning and, and childcare, I think there's a difference between what's fully found funded by Scottish government and what is then fully funded by local government, and it's linked to the requirement. So all 32 councils are committed to delivering that requirement of 1140 hours by the timescale that's been set in, the, in discussion with, with um, government. Um, and picking up on your other point about the allocation of spend uh, and budget across um, councils, um, for those who have been um, councillors, forgive me, but what we do as a business is we have a financial forecast. Whilst we have annual settlements, budget settlements, and that's a core budget that we get from government, we have additional pressures as well, and increasingly that's linked to pay award, given that we've had a pay freeze and a pay cap for a number of years. So that's becoming quite a high risk now going forward for councils, because we need to have commercially um, commercial salaries that can attract and retain staff. And across local government, we are seeing a number of our experienced staff being poached by the private third sector and academic sectors. So we need to make sure that we stay viable as an employer going forward. So the budget process starts off every year from April. We look to the budget that we have. We look at the financial forecast that we anticipate the budget may be and the additional pressures might be going forward. And what we do is we speak to our business units, our directors, and identify an allocation of a potential saving that they should look for within their budgets. Now, in Glasgow, education had a £20 million potential allocation, up to 5%, and in social work, it was £19 million. So effectively, with the potential ring fencing of those budgets, we now need to look to other parts of the council um, service to identify how we might be able to balance the books, because we have no alternative. We have to balance the books within the budget that we have available to us. So sorry, on the early, early years, you're, you're saying you have to deliver that 1140 and the 600 is going to have to be delivered, and that's at the expense of something. core it's budget, which else. is being cut, so it's be libraries or community centres or whatever. Um, on the question of, of pay, um, this is a little bit tangential to the budget itself, but we've had representations made from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in response to a letter that they got from Linda Fabiani, MSP, about pay, equal pace claims. Now, I don't want to get into Glasgow's particular case on that, but obviously you have a lot of experience of that. Uh, but some of these are being settled by local authorities through making compensation payments and some through uh, back pay. 
uh, and the particular mechanism has a significant impact on, for example, pension entitlement. Is COSLA kind of cited on those uh, issues? And is there any cross-council working being done to ensure that people who are entitled to historic equal pay are being treated equally and fairly in the settlements that are being arrived at? Whilst I won't specifically talk about Glasgow, I understand, obviously, speaking to colleagues across local government, settlements are a local set of negotiations with the trade unions and the claimants' representatives if they have private um, firms representing them. Um, there has been some discussion about pension allocation and pension provision, but from a Glasgow perspective, we are in, currently in discussions to negotiate a settlement on equal pay claims. And there's two key things we have to look at is the taxation application, so eight, eight discussions with HMRC and also discussions with our pension fund as to what instructions and guidance they will give us to the allocation of tax and pension cost to those compensation settlements. And I think there's been potential confusion to the word compensation and pay. I think there's a kind of shorthand word for comp we use compensation, but in reality that compensation is made up of a number of factors. It could be interest, it could be um, what we'd class as compensation in a, in, a, in, a, in a court action and also pay a aspect to that. And certainly currently in negotiations with HMRC and our pension fund, tax and pension payments will be deducted from those payments before they are made um, to the claimants. OK, that's, that's helpful. Thanks very much. Getting back to the question of ring fencing and protected expenditure, um, Gil McGregor, you said that... Uh, 42% is the amount of the broad local government budget that you have discretion over, and the rest is either ring-fenced <coughs> or protected. And by protected, you mean protected under the terms under which the government <coughs> give you the settlement, i.e. say so you're not going to get this unless you do uh, X. Again, on the question of transparency, uh, would it not be better to be explicit and frank and say that these are ring-fenced funds. These are ring-fenced funds. Local authorities are the delivery vehicle for them, but they're coming from Scottish government, the ring-fenced funds, in the same way that the UK government might give the Scottish government money, but say, look, this is for, for X. You have no discretion over this. The Scottish government agrees to spend that money, but it's clearly UK money spent by the Scottish government, and that would help accountability. So are, in effect, are we not getting back to quite a substantial amount of ring fencing? We would not be more honest to actually call it ring fencing so that we're clear about who's responsible for it. We do call it ring fencing, and it's been increasing significantly over the, the past few years. I, I think back in 2011-12, only 2% of, of spend was in a ring fence pot, and, and that's lifted up to about 12% now of initiative funding. So there's been a, a significant shift in initiative funding or ring fenced funding or w whatever you wish to call it. Um, as I said before, I think an awful lot of... of what the government brings forward is incredibly valuable and, and a lot of it we can sign up to in partnership and we're very happy to deliver. I, th I just think that, as you say, that the difficulty is that if it is absolutely ring-fenced and that money can be spent on nothing else, it doesn't necessarily reflect what is required at local level uh, and it takes away that local decision making. So as I say there's an awful lot of initiatives which, which we're signed up to and we're happy with. Um, early learning and childcare is a prime example of that but there's other initiatives that have come forward and have been ring fenced for us to deliver which have not particularly come forward in consultation with local government and I think we need to get better at that. We are getting better but I think going forward we need to have much more active discussion before um, big headlines are announced uh, in Parliament uh, you know, for money being given to a particular policy. We need to have much more discussion beforehand with local government to say, is this going to be a good initiative? Is this going to work locally? How can we make this work locally between local government and government and ensure that the funding is fully funded, not just funded as the headline, but at the expense of something else, as I've said before. So we do require some ring fencing. We know that. We know that the, 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 there's initiatives that come up throughout the year 
um, two, three million pounds here or there, which are incredibly important. And we understand that that money will be given to those. And local councils do the same thing as well. Throughout the year, they'll say, we're going to commit X amount to X, Y or Z. So I, I think it's important, but as you say, for transparency, it needs to be understood that that over there can only be spent on that. And as a consequence, if there's a budget saving, it's at the expense of what's down here. You, you, do, you don't describe education funding as ring-fenced. You call that a statutory service. So in effect, it's ring-fenced because you must deliver it. Mm -hmm. You have no choice mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. um, so are the three categories basically discretion, or the four, discretionary, ring-fenced, protected and statutory? Yes, and non-protected. And non-protected. <laughs> Five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. nowhere are those figures presented either in a budget document or indeed by anything you've provided. Um, I mean, we, this committee has been quite keen on more and more transparency about this. And that actually doesn't just mean about... It, what it means is about taking the same numbers and presenting them in different ways so we can understand the impact of those numbers. So, for example, the, the draft budget this year does tell us explicitly and draws together in table, I think, 614, the funding that's coming from other portfolios, health, justice, transport, or whatever, that are actually being spent through local authorities. And that's helpful for transparency. Would it not be helpful as well to allocate funding to the different categories which indicate the degree of flexibility that you have in spending that and what the constraints are on it? I mean, you, you could produce those numbers, I'm sure, yourself if you Absolutely. like, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about transparency all round with the government's draft budget uh, and with the, with the figures you produce as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe just add to that, it, it is actually, we've tried, statutory is um, complicated. Um, I, I wouldn't maybe put it down as a category of statutory because a lot of what we do is statutory, but there is local flexibility around how you meet those statutory obligations. So, for example, it's a um, statutory requirement to collect refuse, but how often you do that has changed. So we've looked at it for a number of years trying to um, separate out what are statutory provisions from the sort of flexibility. And um, there's, there's no issue around the statutory um, requirements when we've had a focus on outcomes, and that was been very much welcomed by local government when we moved to that position. What we've got around education, for example, is you've got statutory requirement to provide it, but alongside that you've got an input measure and you've got the input measures of teacher numbers, you've got the input measures of PEF funding that you've got to spend a certain amount on there. So we've moved away quite considerably from the good place we were in of focusing on the outcomes to having back to input measures and that's where there's an issue with the statutory provision when you're focusing on performance being related to input measures as opposed to the outcome focus which is what we're trying to do with the national performance framework but we're um, we're operating two systems in parallel you we're talking about outcomes from the national performance framework but at the same time we've got these input measures okay just just finally can we um, so that, that's an important point, I think, because I think you make the point in your submission or elsewhere that you want to focus on outcomes. You've said there's been a drift away from that. How has that drift happened? Because I thought this was all signed up to and agreed. Some time ago. So I think with budget pressures and new um, commitments, um, it's the challenge um, that we've talked about as part of the budget scrutiny um, a number of years ago as well of how do you monitor outcomes? And we need to get better at monitoring outcomes because in the absence of that, understandably, people want to say, well, what are you doing? There's an accountability aspect. And the easiest um, model to move to for accountability is to look at inputs. But is that really just because you spend more? Is that service any better? Mm -hmm. Because you've got more teachers in a school, does that mean it's better for children? Because what we've seen is because of the teacher numbers, other aspects such as additional support needs because of budget pressures mm -hmm. have moved so um the focus narrow on input measures is something that COSLA for a long time has not been supportive of and it's very much about the wider system and focusing on the outcomes but that we've been talking about that for some time okay. i think just to move to give a, a assurance to the committee that locally um lo local government is working with all of its community planning partners third sector housing associations and other agencies importantly on outcome driven initiatives um so youth crime reducing doesn't happen by itself it's by clear 
in, um, working very closely together with police and third sector and charitable organisations, which has a direct impact on health and justice mm -hmm. going forward. So just to reassure committee that we are focusing on outcomes, our community plans, our strategic plans that are agreed by each of our councils are outcome focused mm -hmm. and we do monitor those on outcomes. What we need is more flexibility and how we apply the resources that we have and our partner agencies have to continue to drive that effort into outcome driven um, initiatives, which we clearly have a direct impact on society. Okay, thank you. Alexander. Thank you. We've heard various views this morning about the funding process and, the, and even the different names that budgets are called, and that has created some confusion. But the reality on the ground is that, as far as I can see, and for the time I spent uh, as a councillor, uh, we have seen increase on charges, uh, 3, 5 or even 6, 7% across some councils in the last year or two. Uh, all councils have made efficiency savings. All councils have reduced their workforce. And some councils have had to balance the books by going into reserves. And that is the fact the way we are at the present moment, before we have implications from this new budget process that we're about to look at. So can I maybe get a view from you about, with that whole cumulative approach uh, and taking forward, it means that the pressures that are upon local government can no longer be managed by local government themselves. There's nothing that would, you can mitigate uh, further to ensure that you can get uh, the result you want, which is to provide the facilities and services for your communities? Yes, I would agree with that. I, I think one of the difficulties is that fees and charges is a means of, of creating income for councils, um, but it tends to be in areas which um, affect the most vulnerable in our communities and those that perhaps need those services more than most. You, you cited 3, 4, 5% there. I, I think that burial layers have gone up by up to 20% across Scotland as a means of plugging the gap. And this is what I mean about um, the unintended co consequences of new priorities and the funding there at the expense of something else and the hard decisions that councils have to make. I think the reality is that um, one-year budgets are very difficult as well because it doesn't allow you to long-term plan. And there's obviously um, efficiencies in, in longer term planning as well. Sometimes we have a spend to save, so you have a bit of an upfront cost. But over the longer term, you, you can find more efficiencies. But working hand to mouth year on year, and I appreciate that the, the Scottish Government is not in any different a situation either. But hopefully if the UK Government were to, to have a slightly longer term um, financial strategy, that would certainly be useful to the Scottish Government and in turn local government. Because I think short termism is a huge problem. You know, it's a massive problem. We, we can't think three, five, ten years. Although we have projections, we don't have certainty. So it pays a prime example. I'm in the year of, uh, I, I'm in the process of negotiating a multi-year pay deal, and I have no idea what budget we're going to get in 2021, 22. Um, so going forward, that is a, a massive issue. I think. Um, Areas like your IJBs, which we have concerns over funding with, we, we know that money isn't being transferred from acute into uh, preventative and early intervention. I think that's an area that we very much need to focus on. There are things that can be done to improve the outlook for local government. So I'm not all woe is me and doom and gloom. You know, I, I, we're very positive about what we can do to improve our situation, but that has to be done in partnership with NHS, IJBs, government, departmental agencies so th there's a massive piece of work to improve the situation for us and it's not guaranteed that it would happen but for instance that the nhs have now had an indication that they will have three-year projected funding um, and, and be able to work within a one percent window wouldn't that be lovely for us so i i think that if we could work towards in the longer term um, you know, two or three year budgets, that would be fantastic. It would help. But it doesn't take away the fact that in this period, local councils may look to, to having to put up fees and charges for junior swimming or, you know, hire of pitches or, you know, and the list is endless. And I think we're reaching a tipping point there where we, we, we get to a stage where the fees and charges actually prevent people from using the service. And, and I think that has to be balanced as well. So you, you're also, you also indicated earlier about trying to attract your new personnel for the future. Yes. Uh, you know, local government is going to continue. Organisations and structures are there. Uh, you need to have that projection of, of your short and, and medium-term uh, advance so that you can attract 
individuals who will come into the sector uh, and manage the sector on behalf of the communities that they represent. Uh, we as politicians can add to that mix, but, but you need the core staff uh, to be there. And that has been very difficult. Uh, you've been trying to attract. Uh, there's been some councils have looked at golden hellos to try and encourage individuals to come into various sectors so that they can have because you know you're, you're having to re-advertise a number of posts across the piece so all of that uh, is, is creating uncertainty for the sector uh, uh, because of the funding and because of the anxiety that's been created by the prospects of continual cuts within the facilities I think that's a very a very valid point all of chief execs across 32 local authorities have um, workforce planning is a, is a key risk within their, 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 their authority. We, we, we forecast where the risks are, where the demand is increasing, and we are all looking at initiatives about redeployment. So with the early years increase, um, we're looking to redeploy or offer redeployment to our staff and to staff across our community planning partners and our, our local government areas to retrain as child development officers, and, and that's been a very successful process. I mean, now we know with the, the current economy, um, people are going to move into um, portfolios of employment and understanding that and understanding what our young people are looking for in terms of career and reward. How do we create an employment model that is attractive for people to come and join us and stay with us. So also we have to look at our training and development programme as well. But that also comes at a cost, an essential cost, because the risk is if we don't have those in place, we will lose experienced ex experienced and high quality staff. And finally, can, you know, the, can I maybe ask about the, the way that councils are evaluating the impact uh, of the budget reductions when it comes to uh, particularly vulnerable groups uh, where, where, where they have a, a bigger impact within our community uh, and through the increased charges and through the increase uh, of fees because that has a massive implication uh, to these individuals who are in a vulnerable situation. There's a number of aspects to that. Um, often it's easy to say just increase a charge, increase a fee, but that can often be a false economy because participation declines, but local authorities are still left with the, the cost of the service and, and the people running the service. So everything that we do as an option, or we look at as an option, has to go through an equality impact assessment. And that also includes lo looking at protected characteristics and ability to pay. And more and more, what we're also doing is understanding what, what would be a direct and indirect consequence be of a, 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 a fee increase or a service reduction on other parts of the public sector because there could be effectively co cost shunting to other areas and we need to understand what the direct and potentially indirect consequences of that are and how do we how we would we mitigate that thank you thank you very much uh, alec rowley kenny gibson and then Graham <coughs> simpson a couple of questions can can, I, can we keep it short now because can uh, ask the focus in terms of you've talked about the core budget and the 2.37 million pound deal cut have you factored in there, or what have you factored in there for pay awards? The, the teachers' negotiations, I noticed, didn't, didn't make the progress yesterday that some were hoping for. Um, is it your assumption that if, if there is a settlement on teachers' pay, that that will be fully met by the Scottish Government? Um, and what are the implications then? Because other trade unions have said that based on that, they may... Uh, come back looking for more. So what is the assumptions that have been made around pay and specifically on teachers? Is, is the assumption that the Scottish Government will fully fund that? Um, with my other hat on, because I also uh, am the employer's lead for COSLA, so it's me that's negotiating with all the unions um, and the EIS uh, at the moment specifically. Um, obviously, the public sector, lifting of the public sector pay cap last year uh, raised aspirations for our workforce, there's no question of that. And I think that COSLA, in good faith, um, mirrored Mr Mackay's policy. We felt that if people within the public sector were being offered... The, 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 the policy that he put forward, that it was fair to mirror that and, and add that value into our workforce. Um, however, you know, I'm nine months into negotiations and I'm not going to go into the specifics of that, but um, local councils will obviously forecast within their budgets pay going forward. They will put a percentage in. Um, not all of them will have put in 3%, which was what we were actually in the end kind of offering. Um, so, you know, some will have a shortfall. They may only have put in for 1% or 2%, but there's always pay pressure and pay budgeted into forward 
budgets. So it, it, the pressure itself is not horrendous, but where we're having to get to to actually get these deals over the table is really going to stretch local government. And, and the commitment to a three-year deal is a, is a very, very big commitment. At the moment, we're looking at circa £380 million just to cover this year's pay rise, um, if it's agreed. In respect of the, the teacher pay negotiations, um, the, the offer from COSLA is similar to that of other bargaining groups, and any additionality from that would come as a policy intervention from the Scottish Government, and yes, would hopefully be fully funded by Scottish Government. But more importantly, we, we would require it, because it's a multi-year deal, to be fully funded going forward, um, because there will be knock-on costs. The, the, there's obviously on costs for teachers and all our workforce as well, and we have a big pension cost coming over the hill um, in April next year, uh, this year now. So there's massive pressure because of pay, but we do value our workforce. And I think, you know, we've had a period of austerity and they do deserve a pay rise. There's no question of that. It's just doing it within the means that we can do it. Okay, thank you. And specifically on council tax, the, I note that Fife Council have said that in order to meet the, the cut that they're facing, they would have to increase council tax by 11%. Um, has the finance secretary been been clear this year that there is a cap of three percent, and any local authority who puts their council tax up over three percent would would face incur penalties? Uh, is that your understanding? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Can, can I just before I, I go on to Kenny Gibson, they, they, we were talking about raising um, local taxation, etc. What what's your views on the tourist tax? Um, COSL has lobbied very hard over the recent months. We, we launched a campaign last July um, for the transient visitor levy. Uh, my, uh, or COSL's view is that it's not there to plug the gap of budget cuts. It would be there to for individual councils, if it was going to work in their local area, to be applied to bring in additional com um, income to cover the pressures that tourism within that area creates. Uh, it's certainly not a stopgap for, for budget cap cuts. It would be down to an individual authority to see whether it was going to work for their area and have value um, to bring in income to cover, as I say, the cost of tourism and, and the associated costs that go along with that. But I, I think the principle is that local governments should be given the discretion to, to raise monies locally if the conditions suit. OK, thank you. Kenny? Thanks. Very much. Uh, I was actually a member of this committee in 1999, would you believe? And one of the, the issues that we wrestled with at the, t at the time was the issue of the then Scottish executive not fully funding what was called additional burdens for local authorities or responsibilities, as you might or want to call them. So I suppose that, 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 that you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same in terms of the relationship between uh, uh, local government and, and this uh, 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 parliament. Um, but uh, the issue of, of, uh, of ring fencing is a really serious one. Obviously, um, when the Scottish Government came in in 2007, there, was over, there were over 60 funding streams at that time that were ring fenced, and the Concordat in November 2007 abolished those, and they've started to creep back, as you've pointed out. Um, but what the Scottish Government have said, because said, I remember asking Mr Swinney about this directly when he was Finance Secretary, was um, that the reason for ring fencing coming back in was because additional money, for example, was being allocated to local authorities specifically for additional teachers and, um, and uh, um, free personal care and at that time uh, uh, police uh, numbers. But councils were just spending it on other things even though it was specifically given for those purposes. And so the Scottish Government felt that, you know, the partnership wasn't being fulfilled from the local government side. And so therefore they said, well, we'll only give you the money if you spend it on that. I will only give you mon money on that. And so I think there's a wee bit of an issue of, of trust and how the relationship's broken down uh, then. So I'm just wondering how you, how you, you feel that can be kind of, that can be rebuilt, if you like. You know, because uh, the Scottish Government obviously has a manifesto to bring in. I mean, I've always taken the view that any any additional response since 99, wh whether it was Labour, Liberal in power or SNP just now, that any additional burdens or responsibilities should be fully funded. But if you're giving a local authority additional money for something, then it should go on that and shouldn't impact on the core budget. I would entirely agree with that synopsis, 100%. I, I think there was a breakdown of trust and faith between local government and Scottish government over a period of time. Um, you're asking what we're going to do, uh, implying f in the future to improve that. I think we already are. I think we've spent the last year and a half since the, the new presidential team came in 
and new spokespersons came in at COSLA. And I, I think we have um, much closer partnership working. We have much more liaison between government and local government. Um, we have a much more proactive attitude, I think, between ministers and the spokespersons and the associated boards within COSLA to work in partnership. And I, and I think it's very much the start of a journey, but that trust is beginning to be rebuilt. And I think things like... Um, the national performance framework you know, are, are obviously going to guide that as well. The, the negotiations on early learning and childcare is a prime example of good partnership working between government and local government. Um, and, and concessions that Mr Mackay made in the budget last year around lifting of ring fencing and, as I say, wiring some of the social care funding directly to councils rather than putting it through the IJB. That was a huge leap of faith for Mr Mackay um, and he took it and we haven't abused it. And I think you know, the trust works both ways um, and I think we, we must continue to build on that but I, I think as our president continually says you know we shouldn't have tiers of government we should have spheres um, and if we can work uh, more proactively and, and, and more closely with government and, and build that trust then it will deliver better outcomes for everybody so ring fencing is difficult and and it's uh, you know when I was first elected in 2007 all the ring fencing was being lifted and it was fantastic and we were all happy and then suddenly we, we've got you know pretty much between statutory and ring fen fencing 58 percent of our budget that we can't touch so ring fencing does exist but the only way that we can start to break that down is to develop the policies more closely with government in the first instance and then ensure that it, it, the money is going to where it should be going to, um, to a point, um, but obviously with a, an element of local discretion. Because we do know our area is better. I'm sorry, but we do. Thank you. That's a big deal. Thanks. Yeah, um, very quick. And it's going back to uh, council tax. Um, right, right at the start, Councillor McGregor, you... You said that councils had been constrained by the, the freeze. Uh, implication is they're not constrained anymore, um, although there is a, a cap on, on, on how much they, they can increase. Um, is it your position um, that uh, any increase in council tax should not be used to plug funding gaps? That's the first question. And the second question is, if, if every single council increased by 3% three, three would there still be a funding gap um, uh, in every single council? Um, yes, yes. Uh, I think in respect of council tax the 3% the cap um, takes away the local autonomy. Now I, you know, I'm not suggesting that any council would actually put their council tax up by 11% if it came to that, because people have to be judged at the ballot box next time round, and we're, we're very aware of that. Um, but as I say, the local discretion to raise it to a level which assists in not necessarily plugging the gap, because I don't think it should be used for that. I think it should be used for other initiatives within the area. But if we are into dire times and we have a reality check, it would be useful to assist in continuing to deliver core services. There's no question of that. Um, the 3% cap as is would create £80 million worth of additional income for 32 local councils. Um, but no, it, it wouldn't get, go anywhere close at 3% currently to offsetting the, the budget cut that we have. We would probably need to put it up to 9%, which, as I say, no council's going to do. And, and that's the same but the principle every is, single council is in yes, that position? Yes, right. I think so. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's uh, the end of our question. Thank, thank you very much for that. That was very helpful. Uh, I'll now suspend briefly to allow our witness changeover.
Okay, for, our, for our next evidence session today on the Scottish Government's budget for 2019-20, I welcome Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work, and Aileen Campbell, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government. Uh, and Aileen Campbell, this is your first uh, appearance in front of us in your new it position, is, so yes. I just Thank wish you. to wish Hopefully you Hopefully it'll be a nice experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 There's no promises, but it's, it's nice to see you start off in such a positive vein. Uh, Your optimism, thank you. <laughs> and they're supported. Uh, okay, let's get back to business. <laughs> <laughs> they're supported by Graham Owenson, head of local government finance; Robin Haynes, head of local taxation; Caroline Dix, investment manager, more homes division; and Angela O'Brien, team leader, better homes division from the Scottish government. The committee undertook pre-budget scrutiny work during 2018 in relation to workforce planning and local government, housing ad adaptations and more generally the suitability of affordable housing stock for older and disabled people. Following this work, we wrote to the Scottish Government with recommendations in relation to these matters for consideration in advance of the budget being finalised. We have now received a response to this correspondence which is included in our papers and we have the opportunity today to discuss this response as part of our wider scrutiny of the Scottish Budget for 2019-20. First of all, I invite Mr Mackay and Ms Campbell to each make brief opening statements before we move to questions from members. Thank you, Convener. I welcome this opportunity to discuss the Government's spending priorities with you and hear the views of Committee. As I made clear to Parliament, the 2019-20 Budget is being delivered under the most challenging of circumstances. If the Budget consequentials for investment in the NHS are excluded, this year's block grant would be £340 million, or 1.3% less in real terms than it was this year. Despite that, the Scottish Government is providing local government with a real terms increase in both re uh, revenue and capital funding to invest in our public services and deliver a joint priority of sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Uh, local authorities are our key partners in delivering the vital services that the people of Scotland expect and deserve, and that's why I've treated local government very fairly in providing a total settlement of over £11.1 billion. Within this total, I have increased the resource budget by £197.5 million and our capital budget by £207 million, which will result in a total increase in local authority core funding of £405 million. This is a real terms increase of some 2%. This funding package it does include an additional £210 million to deliver on our commitment for the expansion of early learning and childcare entitlement and £160 million for investment in social care. This is real funding to support real day-to-day -day core services. To exclude it, it presents a distorted picture of the resources available to local councils. Local councils, of course, also have the flexibility to increase their council tax by 3%, raising potentially an additional £80 million, securing a real terms increase of 2.7% or £485.1 million in local government spending on services again next year. Thank you very much, Ms Campbell. Thank you. Uh, and like uh, Mr Mackay, I welcome the chance to be here at committee. Uh, so, convener, despite the tough public expenditure conditions driven by the UK government, we've managed to secure significant investment for the communities and local government portfolios so that we can maintain our focus on creating a fairer Scotland, ensure provision of accessible, affordable, energy efficient housing and promote community empowerment and inclusive growth. The budget shows increased investment to support the delivery of 50,000 affordable homes over the five years of this Parliament, with the total spend on more homes increasing by 9% 9 to £789 million in 2019-20. All of the £574 million more homes capital funding will be directly invested in the affordable housing supply programme, chiefly for social housing. Together with the £112 million budget, uh, budget for transfer of management of development funding, which sits in the local government budget line, the total capital investment for affordable homes will be £686 million. And we've also allocated £141 million pounds of tr financial transactions to the affordable programme, which means the total budget for affordable housing in 2019-20 will be £826 million, an increase of £70 million pounds from last year. We're also maintaining our commitment to reducing overall energy costs for Scottish consumers by improving energy efficiency in homes where we can address fuel, fuel poverty, inequality and deal with the challenges of climate change. With an extra £116 million allocated to tackle fuel poverty and energy efficiency in 2019-20, it means we have allocated over £1 billion in this area since 2009. 
Uh, Kamira, I want to put on thanks, uh, on record, my thanks to the committee for raising the housing needs of older and disabled people at the heart, a part of their budget, uh, pre-budget scrutiny, with a particular focus on adaptations and funding for registered social landlords. And I'm pleased that I have been able to maintain this budget at £10 million for 2019-20, championing independent living for older and disabled people in their own home. We're also continuing to invest in supporting measures to tackle poverty and build a fairer and more equal society. To do that, we will continue to strive to reduce child poverty levels, backed up by the £50 million Tackling Child Poverty Fund. We'll also do more to tackle food insecurity experienced by families during the school holidays, and we'll expand access to free sanitary products. We'll also invest £10 million in 2019-20 of the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund as we implement the commitments made in the action plan we published in November and provide £23.5 million to local authorities to support the provision of temporary accommodation. The role the third sector can play to help reduce inequality cannot be underestimated and we continue to provide financial support to enable them to work with communities to tackle tough social issues at source. And I recognise the value of investing in regeneration activity to stimulate inclusive growth and to empower and improve the well-being of people and communities. The Empowering Communities Fund helps develop strong and resilient communities, providing investment to enable communities to develop local plans and proposals, prioritise budgets and develop local asset services and projects. So overall, overall, this budget continues to provide significant investment to meet our commitments in creating a fairer society, providing opportunities for our most vulnerable citizens, supporting regeneration and empowering our communities. OK, can I thank you both for those uh, opening statements. Uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, Derek Mackay, the, you talked about it being a good deal for local government. COSLA didn't quite agree with that. They, you talked about the fairness. They suggested that uh, the local government were treated less fair than other uh, areas. That, uh, even excluding health, they were treated less fair than other areas. Could you respond to that? Well, I disagree with that analysis. For as long as I've been finance secretary, local governments enjoyed a real terms increase in the resources that's proposed by the Scottish Government and for this financial year, just take this financial year, UK Government said austerity would come to an end. It hasn't ended. Again, if you exclude the Barnet Consequentials, I think it's reasonable to do so. We've said we'll pass on the Barnet Consequentials for NHS. So if you exclude that element, if I had simply replicated that budget to local government, it would have been a real terms reduction to local government. That's not what they're facing. It's a real terms increase in resource and capital for the local government settlement. And so in this uh, continuation of UK austerity, I think that's a fair deal for local government. The settlement I have from UK government, I say excluding Barnet consequentials specifically for health, would have been a real terms reduction to the resources at our disposal. What I'm proposing for local government is a real terms increase because of the choices that the Scottish government is, is proposing and using our other levers. So... Um, Recognising that NHS is indeed a priority for this Scottish Government, uh, we set out manifesto commitments about passing on Barnet consequentials. We're doing that. I think we've treated local government very fairly. And I say again, I've been financed. This is my third budget proposed to the Scottish Parliament, and I'm proposing uh, a further real terms increase to local government in this very challenging economic and fiscal climate. So that's why I would describe it as fair. Of course, I would expect to argue. I expect COSLA to argue for more. I think I did the same when I was part of uh, COSLA and when I was a local authority leader, and I know that I'm not the only former local authority uh, uh, councillor in the uh, committee this morning. Of course, local government will quite rightly argue for more. And I'm not underestimating the challenge that local government uh, faces in terms of the fiscal pressure and the other pressures upon public services. But in terms of the resources and the choices we have available, I think it's a very fair settlement. If other parties wish me to do something different, it's up to them to say what different priorities they would have. What else would you do around taxation or reduce budgets elsewhere if you wish to change the local government settlement? But in that context, Kavina, I would say it's a very fair settlement to local government. Thank you for that short response, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> I'm sure you could. The, uh, if, if you take out health, where does local government sit in terms of a level of increase? Because... Again, as I say, it was suggested that, that, that they are not the next priority. So as they say, over the 10-year period since 2010, so that period that the, we've had spending reviews um, and the Tories have been in office, uh, 
beyond that. But over that period, there's been a £2 billion real terms reduction to resource in terms of the Scottish budget. The, as I say, if you exclude health, the uplift, and I welcome the health uplift. I've done so publicly, but if you exclude that for the purpose of understanding the impact for every other portfolio within the expenditure on the Scottish budget, it would have been a real terms uh, reduction. As I say, it's a real terms increase that, that we're uh, proposing. In terms of share of the budget, the government is making, the Scottish government is making uh, choices to invest in our public services, which does mean uh, real terms growth, for example, in education as well, uh, and including local government. So within that, we're making choices to try and provide stability for the country, sustainability for our public services, and also that economic stimulus to try and give us positive economic and sustainable um, growth. Share of the budget, so share of spend to local government as proposed for financial year 2019-20 is about the same, about 27%. In terms of capital specifically, I was watching as much of the evidence as I could earlier in, from a, a COSLA. I mean, some of the very specific elements of what we're choosing to fund surely have to be um, welcomed a, 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 as well. Now, I'm just referencing what the Scottish Government's doing here. Of course, local authorities have the ability, unlike other portfolios, to raise revenue and to raise local taxation. So I think that also has to be set in the context of what other portfolios and other government departments can't necessarily do that local government can. But the starting position is a real terms increase, as I've described. Uh, within that, um, yes, there are um, specific commitments to be made, and I have uh, discussed them with local government. They wouldn't be a surprise to Parliament, because convener, Parliament has asked us to do many of the things that I'm proposing to do, whether it's free personal care or the expansion of early learning and childcare they won't come as a surprise because it's the expectation that these commitments are delivered and there are many expectations that have been asked for by parties right across the parliament. So it's not unreasonable to have them funded in the settlement that I'm proposing to local government. And in watching the evidence, I saw Councillor Gail McGregor described our priorities. They are excellent priorities. They're priorities we support. So it's hardly that we're foisting upon local government unreasonable demands when actually the priorities we support and COSLA support as well. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Graham, then Alec, then Andy. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr Mackay, you're obviously at your uh, entertaining best uh, this morning. Um, so let's have, let's have a look at uh, what you describe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll do our best. Um, so let's see. Um, let's have a look at what you describe as a, a, a fair settlement. Um, because when you um, strip away uh, the ring fence money and you, you, we, we look at the, the core budgets of, of councils, uh, we're actually left with a real terms cut, according to Spice, uh, of £319 million. So the councils are going to have to make cuts. So that's the first question, do you accept that all councils are going to have to make cuts? Local, I mean, if, is that the end of that that's, particular that's question? That's the first question. Okay. In terms of that specific question, see if I'm asked a theoretical question to speculate. If you discount money in the settlement, is there less money? Then, by definition, yes. If I am forced to discount resources in the settlement for a purpose, then by definition there is less money. But in reality, there is more money in cash terms and in real terms. Of course, when you use the public sector deflator, as we understand it, there is a real terms increase. So there is more money in the settlement going to local government as outlined in the budget and as proposed by uh, the circular. Uh, so uh, I don't accept the argument that I should discount resources just because someone else wants to define it in a different way. The Scottish Government's view is if we are funding the public services of Scotland, it's ultimately things that Parliament has, has, has agreed we should do by and large, such as free personal care, a, or, a, 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 for example, early learning and childcare, then I think it's reasonable to describe that as part of the settlement, and that's what I've done. The but the end, sorry, the but for the public, the public will, will want to know, is that more money or is it less? And in fact, this proposes more money for local government in cash terms and in real terms. Simple right. as that. But we're not going to get very far if you don't answer the question. The question was... Will, can, will all councils have to make cuts? Well, in the same way that any part of the public sector right now has to look at efficiencies, has to look at balance in the books, of course local authorities will have choices to make. 
But I don't think you can separate, separate out this issue of core and other things. I was watching the evidence earlier, early learning and childcare, general uh, welfare, social care, our partnership priorities and, and our functions of local government already. How can you describe that as anything other than core to what their duties are? As to the question whether they have to make efficiencies, yes, so will Scottish Government. So will other parts of the public sector. We all have to make choices and priorities in the context of continuing UK austerity, of course, delivered by the Conservatives. Right. So I think we've got somewhere. So you've, you've accepted that councils are going to have to make cuts. You have accepted that. You know, we, we, can, you know, we, can, we can dispute the language. What I'm describing is local authorities you will have You call it more. efficiencies. OK, let, let, let's, argue, let's not argue about the, the, right. the, the definition, but they'll have to make efficiencies um, in the same way that the UK government expects others to make efficiencies as well. Right. Well, I'm here to, uh, to grill the Scottish government, not the UK government. So £319 million real terms cut to core budgets. Yeah. That... Well, we're I don't accept we're that analysis, convener, and I've tried to as clearly as I possibly can explain why I don't accept that analysis. Yeah, I mean, uh, Graham is working on one set of figures, you're yeah, working I, on the other, and uh, right. let's well, try a, get there's to a the core to, of whatever there's a, there's a cut right. to core budgets, um, that, you know, expenditure on things like roads, um, you know, leisure, library... As an example, then. Let's take roads as an example, because I saw it referenced earlier today. Uh, the capital budget is going up, <coughs> so arguably there is more resource in capital, and if local authorities want to spend it on roads, they can spend it on roads. I'm aware of some local authorities proposing an increase in the roads budget, for example. So, you know, we can pick examples, but my point is, in the real world, there is more resource. Now, if you want to argue over definitions and where that leads you to, then fine, let's do that. But I'm talking about real money to local authorities, as proposed by this budget. This budget isn't approved. There's less money for local government. That's the reality of the budget not being approved. Let's see how we resolve that. There's more money overall. Nobody's arguing about that. Oh, but that's very welcome concession indeed. No, that's not a concession. Well, that's, that's fine that's, then. That, in that, cash that, and that, real terms, that's, good. That's, I'm that's glad we clarified that, that convener. That is the reality. But 42% of that money councils um, have... You know, they, they, the bulk of that money councils have no discretion over uh, because it's Scottish Government priorities, which pe people aren't arguing about, They're good priorities. <coughs> but what's left is where the cuts are going to uh, hit. So how, how, how is that fair? You, you are right to say there is more money overall, but when you strip out your, your commitments, there is less. How is that fair? So... Is Mr Simpson suggesting that 42% of local government budgets ring fenced? No. Good. Good. Uh, what element of the budget does Mr Simpson think is ring fenced? The majority of it. Well, that's totally inaccurate. That's an inaccurate figure with no basis in fact. To be fair to Mr Simpson, 58% is, is the, the figure that Cosler came up with when they were talking about statutory and and uh, Ah, well, that's a different question, convener. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but, I think but to be fair, the, the committee he's, runs he's the risk of getting, getting different elements mixed up between what's a, what's a statutory function and what's ring fencing. Actually, the Scottish Government, since its time of office, has reduced ring fencing, has absolutely reduced ring fencing, taking billions of pounds out that are previously ring fenced so that local authorities had the discretion. Yes, there are statutory requirements. That's quite a different thing altogether than ring fenced funding. Statutory requirements is that which this Parliament, of whatever persuasion, has chosen to say is a statutory service. Are we saying that every local authority should be left to its own devices and not have a national consistent service in certain regards? So I think the committee has to be very careful not to mix up statutory services with necessarily how they're, uh, how they're funded because there's very specific conditions around ring fence funding which the government has uh, reduced since the signing of the Concordat and the change to the arrangements and how local government was funding. Are there some elements of this budget that is ring fenced? Yes. Early learning and childcare? Yes. But do you know the, 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 the total of funding, I think it's about £210 million pounds for early learning and uh, childcare, uh, that composition of how that would be distributed was done in agreement with local government. And there was a departure from normal process here, which is sometimes that it's distributed on what uh, could be a population basis or a pupil basis or whatever else. 
Local authorities costed what they thought would be the reasonable amount to deliver the policy in a local authority by local authority basis and asked us to fund that in that fashion. And that's ring-fenced. That element is ring-fenced. But that element, that, that totality and that distribution was agreed with local government. So sometimes there are occasions to have a ring-fenced fund, convener, and that's a good example. Let people ask you questions. I'm trying to answer it as comprehensively as I can. Uh, Graham, do you have any other questions at this point? No, not for now. OK. Uh, Alec? OK. I did think the pantomime season was over, but we seem to be drifting back into it there. The, 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 question, the, question, the question of ring fencing is that if you look at a council budget, almost 50 per cent of that council budget will be education, for example. You then, the, the bulk of that will be on pay, teachers pay, other staff pay. And, and, and that, I think, is the point we're trying to make, is that if you then take the IGB and social work, you start to see that you're up about 70 per cent, 70 odd per cent of the council budget. So the ability to cut starts to come from those other services disproportionately. And, and you get to a point where we are talking to council leaders this week, they're saying, you know, do we, do we just stop cutting the grass? Do we stop the street cleaning and the impact that that has? And I think, you know, if we're being serious about that, that's, that's the difficulty. You and I won't disagree over failed Tory austerity. We won't disagree where, where, where we're at with that. Cosler's point, however, is that they believe that they have taken a disproportionate cut, 7%, over the last, I think they said, 10 years, compared to less than 1% of the Scottish Government budget. So can I focus, therefore, on a few points? The first point is that if you take the example of Fife, where I live, Despite the fact that you say there's an increased budget, in this current financial year, there's something like £4 million being cut out of the education budget. Secondary schools across Fife are having to take a cut around £2 million of that. And as a result of that, parent councils are now coming together, campaigning together, because the impact that that cut is having on frontline learning and teaching is, 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 is horrific. Uh, we, we kids having to be, be no supply teachers, no, no, no where teachers are off sick, etc. So, so I think we really need to boil this down to the public are hearing this, this debate about whether it's a cut or not a cut, but they know that their kids are going into schools and those schools are having real-term cuts that are impacting on their education. So the fact is that, that the, the, the key argument that COSLA make is that, yes, Aileen Campbell outlined the additional monies coming into communities for specific uh, policy areas that nobody would dispute. We heard Cosler this morning say these are good areas. Their point is those additions come to, come to well, they've, they've outlined them, the, the free sanitary products that, that, that Aileen Campbell uh, rightly mentions cost £3 million. The Barclay implementation at the Finance Secretary is dealing with £3 million. The Carer Act, £10 million. Frank's Law, £30 million. Integration, uh, £120 million. Extension of learning and childcare, uh, £234 million. So their point is that if that's where these areas are focused on, they still end up with a deficit to continue to deliver the current services that they're running. Do you accept that? And do you accept as a result of that, that's why in five parents are rightly angry and calling on the government and the local authority to do something about the cuts to frontline education? Well, first of all, convener, within all of that, there was a question about the treatment of local government as part of Scottish Government budget decisions. Um, I, I also know that you discussed earlier the nature of reductions uh, elsewhere. Um, I mean, Scotland, in terms of local government, has the best treatment of local government in terms of the resource settlement to local government. Uh, uh, less protected in Wales and certainly less protected in England. So I just want to put that in context. Also, a part of the issue in terms of the longer term, and I've referenced it earlier, the Scottish Government has made a commitment around passing on Barnet consequentials in relation to health to health services, and that's what we've done. Um, so that's, that's an issue there as well. But for as long as I've been Finance Secretary, and that's how Mr Rowley posed the question, I've proposed, in terms of two budgets passed and a further one being proposed, a real terms increase to local government. So I, being asked, what am I going to do? for local government, propose a real terms increase to the local government settlement. Now, within that other priorities and choices, yes, there are. Uh, interestingly, we have, as a government, tried to protect uh, education. It's up to local authorities if they wish to do that as well. 
Actually, a number of uh, local authorities and overall spend in, on education it has been uh, improving. Um, yes, we have embarked to do things like protect the pupil-teacher uh, uh, ratio commitment, deliver the pupil equity fund, and in terms of the education portfolio as proposed in the Scottish budget, uh, that's also uh, improved uh, in, in real terms. So I... I would say that we have um, <coughs> tried to honour our commitments around education and tackle the attainment gap that I know is important uh, to Mr Rowley. In terms of ind individual local authorities, I don't think as Finance Secretary I should go through each local authority and instruct them how to, to do the absolute detail of their budget and what proportion they should allocate um, to every portfolio. They will have choices to make. There's also live pay negotiations underway at the moment in terms of teachers and non-teachers as well. And again, I just put it in the context. Let's take non-teachers, the live pay offer, about 3.5% for 18, 19, 3% beyond that. Now, surely local authorities could only make such an offer if they thought that was affordable, I would suggest to convener. So it is about choices. Local authorities will have to uh, make the choices that are right for them locally. But Parliament has asked us to do certain things. Members of each party in here have campaigned for certain elements to be put into the budget and have been built in. Do members wish to go through it and say which we shouldn't fund, which should be de-ring fenced? But if Parliament's asking us to make these commitments around expansion of services, it's not unreasonable to have them identified in the budget, I would argue, um, uh, convener. So I say fair settlement, the share of the Scottish Government's budget is uh, protected, I have received from UK government a real terms reduction for the, for the reason that I've explained earlier, excluding health consequentials, but in that context proposed a, a real terms increase for local government. And also local authorities can use their council tax power up to 3% to generate a further £80 million for local services. Let's, let's come to that point in terms of we, we had the discussion earlier whether it was efficiency savings or cuts. Local authorities would argue that, that there are no efficiency savings left to find that they have cut to the bone and that's why they're now cutting directly into frontline services. Are you satisfied that within all the other Scottish government departments and portfolios that, 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 that you have done your job to look at where there are efficiencies and are you satisfied that, that there are no efficiencies to be found within those other portfolios and those other areas? Very fair question, convener. And of course, I've gone through with each cabinet secretary their portfolios to be assured that they've tried to identify any savings or efficiencies that they possibly can. So, I, of course, I have gone through that. Will we find new efficiencies that we work our way through, whether it's procurement or better productivity or asset approaches or whatever it happens to be, of course. And there are also priorities and choices to be made as well. There might be some things that are less important to government. There might be some things that are less important to local authorities as well. But when it comes back to what we choose as priorities, I tell you again what Cosler told you this morning. They are excellent priorities. That was the words of the resources spokesperson from Cosler. They are excellent priorities. They are priorities we support. I don't think it's an unreasonable place to be for the Scottish Government to say you know, our, our priorities are, are those, and Cosler happen to think they're excellent priorities as well. But it will... It potentially mean deprioritisation of other things. It's not for me to say every element of a local authority's budget, but that which we have set out, that which we have set out has been clear and transparent and set out in the budget a document set out in my statement. I also caught reference to uh, the national performance framework earlier on. That's about outcomes, not about inputs. It's about outcomes. Uh, and I believe that that will still be delivered because that's about how you work together. It's not about quantum of resource. It's about how we bring to bear the totality of a resource to deliver transformational change. So I have no reason to believe that we won't deliver on the, the, the purpose and the outcomes that we've identified in the National Performance Framework. I actually think that, that, that you have hit the nail on the head in terms of that. Nobody's disagreeing with the priorities that the Scottish Government have set out. But, 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 those, are, but those are your priorities and as you say yourself as a result of those priorities local authorities are having to deprioritize other areas and one of them in five is frontline education and schools that's the bottom line but could i turn to to to, to, to aileen campbell can i turn to aileen campbell because I, I do want to ask a question 
in terms of the portfolio and the, the housing. And, and obviously, given the, the, the housing crisis in Scotland, 50,000 new affordable homes is, is, is commendable and, and, and we need to work together to deliver. Uh, are you satisfied, however, that, and, and looking at those 50,000 homes, that we are getting it right in terms of prioritising the kind of homes? So when we talk about age and adaptations there, we talk about... Um, the demographics, people getting older, uh, and I say this for experience in five, the last, the last um, five year session, they built 2,700 homes and that was good, but actually where we could have done better was to prioritise the kind of housing. Are you satisfied that we're getting that right and it links in with social care and it links in with all these other areas? It, well, absolutely. And I think you know the, the ambition behind the 50,000 houses is the correct one. Uh, you've articulated that there had been uh, issues and challenges around housing, so it's uh, uh, correct that we focused in on delivering uh, 50,000 houses and we've articulated the significant investment that we're putting in and have put in over a number of years to increase the number of houses. And of course, we're also cognizant of the fact that we have an ageing population. We need to make sure that those houses that we're building are fit for purpose, not just in the here and now, but also in the future. So alongside the current uh, ambition around the 50,000 delivery. Uh, we're also working around what that vision will look like beyond 2021 as well, working through with partners around the changing demographics, the different ways in which we'll need to ensure different innovations around building techniques and all those things that are, can enable us to adapt those homes to be suitable for people's changing needs. So that work's also, also happening uh, as well, and that's working with um, partners, house builders, um, public, private sector, uh, local authorities, uh, uh, housing associations and, and such like to make sure that the point you make, which is a valid one, is to make sure that we absolutely get it right. And in the here and now, we're also uh, making uh, good pro progress on ensuring that the houses, the housing stock that we're delivering now is also mindful of the, the different needs of people in the communities that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, okay, thank you very much. much. Can, can I just, uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, Derek... Okay. The, can I just ask a question? Who's responsible for the cuts in education in the five council areas, at five councillors of the Scottish Government? Well, as I say, I, I, I'm very mindful at this stage. I mean, I'm trying not to be too partisan. That at this stage, local authorities do put up options. Not all those options transpire to be a finalised budget. I have to say there's a consultation period, but I don't run Fife Council. The administration of Fife Council run Fife Council. Um, I'm responsible for Scotland's uh, budget. Um, so that'll be for the administration of Fife to answer for in terms of the decisions they take. But I'm just very mindful at this point in the budget cycle, councils will um, consult on savings options, uh, but ultimately at their budget meeting decide what they're taking forward. So we are at the point in a cycle where the decisions of our council might not necessarily be the, the decisions that, that materialises the budget for um, the year ahead. But specifically in relation to education, education has been protected insofar as the portfolio was protected. We are protecting the pupil equity fund that I do believe is making a difference. Uh, we've got agreements around pupil teacher ratio that are really important. And I think the extension over the last number of years of things like uh, free school meals has helped made a difference in terms of poverty and inclusion and giving children the best start in life. And of course, convenient, we're working on the evidence that told us early years really matters. So if you want kids to get a good start in life, primary education is important, but so is early years. And that's why we're expanding the entitlement to early years as well, and we are uh, funding it. Incidentally, convener, it, it might be worth noting that sometimes we over-provide, we over-fund a particular commitment. We don't necessarily ask for a clawback of that resource. And that did happen in terms of early learning and childcare. We, we over-provided for the resource, and we didn't claim it back. And in addition to that, as I say, we are... Um, putting in the resource that was asked of us to meet the, the requirement for 1140 hours. Thank you very much. Andy? Uh, thank you very much, and um, it's been interesting uh, listening to these uh, exchanges. I think the fundamental problem and the issue here is that the, the non-ring friends, the discretionary funding available to local authorities is, be, is being cut, and therefore to deliver early years or anything else, um, they're going to have to be deprioritizing or cutting um, other services that local government uh, uh, provides. And so I wonder to assist this analysis in table 611, 614 and 615 of the budget, and I understand if you're not able to answer this right now, but if you could follow it up in writing, that would be useful. What proportion um, of the funding identified in those tables is ring-fenced? 
that they say if you ask me to do that analysis, you need a break convener if you wish no, to no, do it. No, no, indeed. But, uh, yeah. I, can, can I give a, a, an, a, an area of context overall? Um, when the previous administration w was in office, ring fencing was well over £2 billion, pounds, roughly. £2.7 billion. Pounds, and it's currently billion. at about... £0.9 billion. Point nine billion. So that's the context of... If you ask about ring fencing, that's the context of ring fencing. We've taken it from that figure down to point nine. That So that's the, 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 the headline figure, if you like, convener. So, so point nine is the answer in tables 6, 11, 14 and 15. It's the answer from table 6, 11. OK, fine, 6, 6, 11. 6, 14 and 15 are ring fence too. So 6, 14 is the... Uh, revenue funding within other portfolios? Uh, those sums will be transferred into the block grant. They won't be ring fence. So when it says, for example, um, £120 million for health and social care and mental health, that's not ring fenced? It'll go into the block grant. It'll go to, and local authorities can spend it on libraries or roads? You'd, you'd need to refer back to the Cabinet Secretary's settlement letter about what the expectation is on social care spend, but the, the £120 million will go into the block grant. So, so when you refer back to the Cabinet Secretary's letter, that's a letter that says you get this money if you do that. That is not, and if that's accepted, that is, an, that is in effect ring fencing. I think, again, need to be careful with the definitions here. That was my point about the difference between a statutory duty and how certain elements are funded. I think you need to be careful around that. Um, it's true to say um, that it, there are conditions attached to certain elements of funding. It, table 614, uh, as is described, is coming from other portfolios to local government. Very specific about that. And that's the reason for that particular transfer. Right, but this, the health and social care and mental health, 120 million. The intention is that that 120 million shall be transferred to local authorities, and the intention is that it shall be spent on health and social care and mental health. That's the intention. Right. But Fine. Again, being clear, the specific terms of a ring fenced fund, which is what the member asked about, what Mr. Whiteman asked about, doesn't apply. Fair enough. We, we so may have to review the, the language around this in the years going you're forward. You're correct about the intention. Yes, yes. Okay. I'll accept that. And in 615, local government funding out with core settlement, for example, um, Clyde Gateway Urban Regeneration Company, half a million. The expectation is that that will be spent on the Clyde Gateway Urban Regeneration Company. In table 6, uh, 615, yes, it would be. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that, that's helpful. Um, can I just... Um, Turn to a sort of different matter, but it's it's, it's relevant to the to the budget. And this was a, an issue that was raised by the Accounts Commission in their Financial Overview 2017-18 uh, report at the end of last um, year. And they talked about the, um, the funding distribution uh, model and how the uh, the granted expenditure needs-based methodology. The, 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 the quantum to which that has a, uh, is, is applied has been frozen at 7.9 billion since 2008-9. And that further funding that's been provided since then on top of the grant-aided uh, expenditure has been distributed either using the same proportions as the GAI funding or through a separate methodology. Etc. And the Scottish Government advises, this is paragraph 18 of the Accounts Commission report, the Scottish Government advises that in 2017-18, billion was distributed through the GAI methodology and £3.5 billion through individual separate methodologies. And they're going to say the basis of the calculations for the separate methodologies are not publicly available and should be more transparent. So my question is, is the Accounts Commission correct to say that they're not publicly available? And secondly, can you make them publicly available if they're not? Okay, uh, convener, I, I don't have the report uh, in front of me, but the basic answer to the question is uh, local government funding is indeed complex, uh, but the methodology is agreed with local government, so the distribution is generally worked through with local government. Uh, like, like other former councillors in the, in the committee, uh, 32 local authorities will have 32 different perspectives as to local government finance distribution, each with a view that would suit 
their own council. For that reason, it's no surprise that there's no rush from COSLA to suggest that we revisit the methodology. But in essence, the workings, I, I have no objection to the workings being shared whatsoever. It fill your boots, uh, uh, convener, to the, the, the internal workings of how every penny is distributed. Um, ultimately, the, the principle behind, of it, behind it is a degree of equalisation, because, of course, if every council retains its council tax and its non-domestic rates, the purpose of the rest of the grant aided support is to provide equalisation so that services can be provided in a, a fairly equitable basis across the country. And that's what the, uh, that, that, that element of funding does. And, and you know, generally speaking, that needs-based approach can be determined by a population, length of road, a whole host of indicators that take you through that. The committee is more than happy to look at it, but there has been no request from COSLA to revisit it. I'm not. I'm very brief question then. Is there guidance sent out to the local authorities about how you, you're saying it's very complex methodology? It's, it's 32 different uh, responses, really. But is there guidance sent out on how that methodology should be worked at? And would that be something? There's that a distribution and settlement have? group within um, Scottish Government and COSLA that works. So every time, say, there's a, there's a fund or a, uh, a, a, a change to methodology or something, it'd be agreed. it would go through that group. It would be agreed with local government. Early learning and childcare is a good example. We stepped away from the needs based formula in terms of just how maybe how many young people you have, but actual cost, because there's a recognition that different councils may need to do different things. So if there's a departure from it, it's been done in agreement. If it's the application of it, it's understood. And on each issue, as members will be well aware, on each issue it goes to council leaders uh, following a recommendation from that group. I'm more than happy to share what we've got with committee. I'm sure COSLA would feel the same. My point is to change any formula. Each local authority would argue for any change that would suit them best. That's the right, that's their duty, that's the expectation. Um, to be fair, um, my line of questioning, I wasn't asking... I'm just explaining how it's come about, that complexity. Yes, yes, no, but the, my, my question is merely the Accounts Commission say that these methodologies are not publicly available. Well, and could, can they, will you commit to make them publicly available? If COSLA agrees, why wouldn't I? And I think I started off my answer so to say yes. So COSLA would have to agree? <clears throat> well, we could share what we've got. I'm trying to be as helpful. I don't think anyone is trying to object to sharing the information. Uh, we can happily provide what we've got, and members can probe it. Uh, okay, that's fine. I think that's I said fill your boots, because you might find that it's not as interesting as you think it is, convener. Uh, it's the first time I've ever had a cabinet secretary uh, invite me to fill my boots, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> With respect, this is about just about just making the methodology. Yes. Fine, good, thanks. I'll share what we, what, 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 uh, that, whatever we can in terms of that fine. methodology. Um, you talk about... Um, and in your uh, circular to local government, you um, talk about a 3% council tax cap. What statutory authority do you have to impose this? Well, essentially, um, we have, a, in previous years, had a sanctions. I'm proposing a sanction-free budget. There's an expectation that local authorities um, continue um, to, to, to cap it at 3%. Um, and that's been the expectation um, of... Uh, Scottish Government. Uh, the Scottish Government does have capping uh, uh, authority and statutory powers so to use, but we've actually um, not had to, to deploy these because it's been done by local authorities thus far. But your statutory authority to cap is not the power that you're invoking to impose the 3% cap, and that power is not designed to uh, control how much uh, uh, the, the council tax rate under Section 19... 93 of the Local Government Finance Act of 1992. I'm making it clear that it can be that it's uh, an expectation. It's been complied with thus far and no statutory power has been uh, required. OK, thanks very much. Um, in our pre-budget scrutiny, we were looking, amongst other things, at workforce planning. Uh, we wrote to the government and, and received a response um, in November. Um, um, I'm just wondering what aspects of the... Um, the uh, report that we provided and the observations and recommendations we made have been taken into account in the budget? Um, so, convener, I think we sent a response uh, to the uh, committee and we did absolutely consider not just the issues that the committee raised on workforce planning, but certainly, as I think I said in my opening remarks, around the issues that you've been looking at around adaptations into account as we uh, decided on the, the budget. Um, it is also important to recognise, though, that local authorities are responsible for their local authority 
uh, their own workforce. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't a, a common interest in making sure that we make best use of uh, resource and that we work together on issues around workforce planning. But certainly, you know, predominantly, um, local authorities are responsible for their own workforce. But certainly, we took account of the issues that you're raised in your in your. The example of how it was taken account of in the budget. Well. Um, so, for instance, I think I talked around some of the things that we do in the government around um, working with... So, in my own portfolio, we work with local authorities around making sure that we've got the right skill set there in terms of making sure that we can build uh, houses for, to reach the 50,000 uh, target. So, that's work that's always ongoing. But I think more generally, I think that the points that you make are things that we take on board as a government around how we work through any challenges around workforce. But again, I would just reiterate the point that local authorities are predominantly uh, responsible for their own workforce. And it wouldn't be right for us. I don't think you would, tell, you would want us to tell uh, local authorities how to manage their, their own workforces. But certainly we do, in my regular meetings with uh, COSLA, these are things that we can, we can talk through. We can engage them with the relevant uh, cabinet secretary. So, for instance, you've had a very strong interest today on uh, education. So those are things that the education ministers will, will be taking forward along with COSLA and other interested parties around making sure that we've got the right workforce balance that all parts, you know, from um, the uh, further and higher education uh, systems that we're all working together to make sure that we can uh, get the right balance in, in place. Okay, thanks very much. Um, you, you mentioned housing. Um, uh, in the budget statement, uh, Mr. Mackay, you made on the 12th of December 2018, you said, and I quote, we've had confirmation of 80,000 affordable houses built since 2007. However, SPICE have done the research on the Scottish Government's own affordable housing supply programme uh, statistics uh, and found that, in fact, um, there's only 58,427 have actually been built, that the rest have been acquired off the shelf or, or rehabilitations. Is that, do you, you agree with that? Do you have that detail? Wait, we've, we've delivered on the 80,000 um, thousand a uh, The Secretary said that we've had confirmation of 80,000 affordable houses built. Built means to build something. He, he, he didn't say we've had confirmation of 80,000 delivered. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's say 80,000 delivered for the avoidance of yeah, doubt. And, and by the way, the budget proposes in the next financial year over £800 million to stay on track uh, for the 50,000 uh, commitment. And the 50,000 commitment is to build? To deliver 50,000. Deliver 50, Patrick Harvey asked on the 17th of May 2018 at First Minister's questions that the First Minister stood in a manifesto that promised we will invest £3 billion to build at least 50,000 affordable homes in the next five years. Does that commitment stand? And the First Minister said yes. Well, our commitment is to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, which we are making uh, good progress on. We expect to make that meet that target. We have considerable resources behind that. In fact, of any of the of any of the governments across these aisles, this government is the one that's delivering affordable houses for people in Scotland, and we expect to meet meet the the target of delivering fifty thousand uh, affordable homes. And we've made good progress on. In fact, this, since the, this government came into in power since two thousand seven, have made uh, incredible. A progress on delivering affordable homes. The First Minister agreed that the commitment was to build, not deliver, and I've read the SNP manifesto. I mean, the sema you, can, you can argue over the semantics. What uh, my point is... Clearly, that, that's that clearly my point, no, no, my point is that we have got... Exactly. And I told the, the, you about the resource that we've got there. We're delivering on target to deliver and reach the 50,000 target. We have more houses built in Scotland compared to other... Per head I'm not asking about other parts. Other parts of the I'm not UK. asking about and other. So we're making good progress, and we've got 800, over 800 million there to, to fund okay, that okay. commitment. Okay, okay. This is like an earlier conversation where we're going round in circles. Uh, Andy's talking about build. You're talking about delivered. We've got that on the record. I don't really think there's any more point in going over it. We won't be spending £800 million to build houses. So it, the, approving the budget kind of helps to meet that target. And it, it helps as well because I mean, it's 80,000 affordable homes delivered since 2007, 54,000, over 54,000 for social rent, including over 10,000 council houses, um, 19,000 for affordable home ownership and 6,000 for affordable rent. That's since two, 2007 and we're on target yep. to deliver the commitment for fifty to deliver 50,000 houses for people of Scotland, considering that everyone, I think, has understanding of the significant housing need that's out there. Thank you. Uh, Andy, have you got any more questions? No, sorry. No. Annabelle? 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Kavira, and good morning, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretaries. Bureau. Um, yes, I wanted to firstly, with uh, Mr Mackay, touch on the issue of reserves, because that hasn't really been, been mentioned thus far. And it would perhaps be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary could indicate how much, by way of reserves, the Scottish Government holds. The the, um, so we, we have a particular um, reporting process for um, uh, reserves that... Um, the Scottish Government would, would hold. Of course, the arrangements have changed in terms of uh, the, uh, the reserve. Um, I think it would be of interest to know that the most recent um, reporting stage, uh, the Scottish Government held revenue reserves of £192 million. It might be of interest of, to the committee to know that local authority general fund revenue reserves uh, as reported on the 31st of March 2017, was £1,178 million, just to put the Scottish Government's reserve into context. I, I respect our financial arrangements are different, but I think both uh, figures are helpful. Uh, well, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, and uh, it's quite a contrasting position. Would the Cabinet Secretary be aware, then, um, since 2010, uh, whether that amount held by local authorities represents an increase or, or a, a, a decreased amount? Well, as I understand it, the latest figures show uh, that over the period 2010 to 17, local authorities' general fund reserves have increased from £680 uh, million pounds to that figure I've just given of £1,178 million. Pounds. That's an increase of uh, 73%. OK, I, I, I have to say, I mean, we've been hearing, you know, about the problems caused in particular by the continued UK Tory government's austerity programme uh, at Westminster and reductions indeed in the, the Scottish government's budget. I, I just wonder how then, you know, if you're a member of the public and you've been trying to follow the debate we've had thus far in committee this morning with COSLA uh, and now with the Scottish government uh, cabinet secretaries, how, how, how could you explain, how could I explain to a constituent, my constituency of Cowton Beath that whilst, you know, uh, we've heard that uh, the uh, Labour SNP5 Council administration are looking at different uh, uh, spending decisions that they may wish to make in education and other areas. How does that fit with the fact that all these local authorities are sitting on £1 billion? I mean, how does that... You know, it's quite a contrasting position when we hear about, you know, what they feel they may have to do in terms of local service provision, and yet they're sitting on these reserves. I understand that reserves are for a rainy day, but... Have we not re reached? Have we have we not reached the rainy day? You know, I don't know if the cabinet secretary would Could like be, to give thoughts on that. I, I would wish to be slightly careful here as finance secretary. I will absolutely answer for the Scottish government's um, very modest uh, reserve, which I, I, I frequently engage uh, with the finance committee uh, around, and I do that. I'm sure at next evidence session there. I, I shouldn't make any comment on local authorities' individual reserves, other than to say that I overheard Mr Rowley say, well, it's raining now, not 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 actually outside, but um, I'm glad to say the sun is shining. Uh, but, but I think the point is that in the period of austerity, should we be using the resources to the maximum to try and provide stability, sustainability and stimulus? Yes, I should as a general rule. And in terms of the reserve that I have, again, the financial arrangements of the Scottish Government have changed as a consequence of the fiscal framework. Um, and... Uh, local government has actually been a beneficiary of uh, the underspend that's been generated and carried forward. So when I've been asked about previous reserves, how would I spend it? Actually, local government was a beneficiary of an underspend being carried forward uh, into the following financial year. So I carry forward resources. Anything that's unallocated and held in, in reserve, again, I, I report to Parliament uh, at the appropriate um, fiscal um, uh, reporting stage. But that's the, the figures as last um, uh, reported. I can only say that it's for local authorities to be asked about how they choose to use their reserves, which I'm sure they would say in some cases are allocated, some are unallocated. There is a healthy um, range at which to keep reserves, but that's the context at which the Scottish Government has. So if there's any perception a, a, that I have a fantastic reserves to deploy. A, I don't. The, the position is as, as I've outlined. I thank the cabinet secretary for that answer, and it is, I think, interesting for the public to to be aware that uh, since 2010, as we've uh, experienced sadly many, many rainy days in light of UK government austerity in particular, that local uh, authority uh, 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 resources uh, in terms of their 
um, reserves have increased by some 350 billion uh, million pounds, sorry, 350 million pounds over uh, the period. And I think maybe some members of the public would find that quite difficult to understand and they may be encouraged to ask the local authorities uh, what is the position per each local authority. If I may convene one last series of questions to the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, for Communities. Um, talking of, of the UK government's austerity programme, which has not sadly uh, been brought to an end far from it, um, I, I just wonder if the CapSec could uh, let us know what uh, uh, she plans to do in the next financial year to mitigate uh, against these uh, continuing uh, austerity-driven measures and, and welfare cuts. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, you know, as uh, Derek Mackay talked about, our own budget has suffered. Um, the block grant has uh, reduced by £2 billion in real terms over the last decade. And I think, um, you know, that undoubtedly has impacted as well on our ability to, uh, do, to pursue policies that can um, help people cope with that, with the social... Uh, the social security cuts and the welfare reforms that have been uh, happening as a result of uh, UK government decisions. I think also what's very important has been the very recent uh, visit to Scotland by the UN Special uh, Rapporteur, who made some very uh, telling uh, comments about what he, what surprised him about what devolved governments were having to do to cope with ongoing austerity uh, and our a decision to mitigate as best we can uh, some of the worst impacts of welfare reform and social security uh, cuts made by the UK government. In fact, he uh, also made comment that the mitigation comes at a price and is not sustainable. Um, he was surprised that we were having to do as much as we are to try and help uh, provide that uh, buffer towards people who are in particularly vulnerable. So we have, um, we expect to spend over 125 million this year on welfare mitigation and measures to help protect those on uh, low incomes. And I've also talked around some of the, the things that we're continuing to do around uh, child poverty and the £50 million pounds that comes uh, along with that. But the, there is a significant spend on mitigation, which will have to continue, uh, particularly because the very, very much politically driven uh, and very politically motivated decision to uh, impact uh, most on those who are most vulnerable in society uh, means that we'll have to continue mitigating and softening the blows of UK government decisions. Um, and, you know, I think the UN rapporteur made some very uh, interesting comments around that and I think shone a light on just what devolved governments across the UK are having to do to help protect their citizens. No, I, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says and I, I just wonder if, if the Cabinet Secretary could just, off the top of her head, give us a few examples of what she could do with that money if it went to, to her. Ms Mackay is looking, but let's assume that it went to, her, to the Cabinet Secretary for communities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, so yeah. let's assume that just for the, the sake of the mm -hmm. question. And, you know, what, for example, could you do with that money? The money that we are spending mitigating the policies mm -hmm. that we didn't vote for and don't support, what could you do with that? Could you do with well, that we money? made a commitment to, we're, and we're working towards the commitment around income supplement. So that would be a, a policy that we would pursue as a government to try and lift children out of poverty which would be made all the easier if we had more resources at our disposal, if the UK government weren't to continually politically motivated uh, decisions around cutting uh, social security or changing welfare uh, benefits. Uh, we could use the income supplement as a way to help lift families out of poverty. But the reality is that we're continually having to mitigate those uh, impacts which prevents us from doing some of the things we would want to do and it also reduces the budget that we have at our disposable, disposal to um, pursue other policies as well that are positive policies, things that we would want to do in our, in our own right um, as, a, as a government. So that would be one thing. That's one, the, one of the policies that we are working at the moment. It's one of the things within the Tackle and Child uh, Poverty Plan that we're working towards at the moment. But you know, everything would be made more easy uh, or, or simpler if we had uh, the funding that we are currently having to use to mitigate if we were able to use that funding elsewhere. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Alexander. Thank you. Uh, earlier on, Cabinet Secretary, I asked COSLA about the situation we find ourselves in in councils at the present moment in time. We talked about that <coughs> councils are increasing charges uh, and we, we, I indicated it might be 3 to 5 to 7% and they indicated 20% increase in charges was going on burials. 
Uh, so that, that is the current situation uh, that some councils are finding themselves in. Uh, I also indicated that every council is doing efficiency savings. Every council is reducing its workload. Uh, and uh, a number of councils are balancing their books by using reserve. Uh, in my own region of Mid Scotland and Fife, I think every single council across that region is out to consultation to the general public uh, about what is going to happen uh, to their services, uh, and they're giving them some options, uh, but m the majority of these options are for a reduction. So that's the reality that I face in my region at the present moment in time. It would be interesting to hear your views on that. Interesting to understand, therefore, how a half billion pound tax cut to the richest in society would help us with that particular predicament. Uh, convener coming from a Conservative member, that's very interesting. Charges are only allowed if you're charging for education, of course, whether that's tuition fees, although I accept the Conservatives have changed their position, I think, on prescription charges was the latest U-turn. Um, so it appears that the Conservatives are for charges if you're trying to be educated or if you're um, a, potentially in a, another position. So, uh, Convener, I do think that all members have to reflect on their own uh, political position when asking about budget choices. Uh, the member didn't reflect on the positive things that the budget's proposing in terms of uh, continuous support for um, school building, for housing, for capital, for town centres. Town centres at one point was something that Conservatives were interested in and demanded a ring-fenced fund to support town centres. And I proposed a capital investment in town centres and not a mention from the usually generous Mr Stewart. So I think that every member should reflect on the positives of this budget as well. The, 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 the alternative of this budget not being approved, as I've described at the outset, convener, is less money for local government. That's the reality um, in terms of the decisions we're asking Parliament to take. Now, all of those things listed that, that was described as excellent priorities and very welcomed, uh, and Mr Stewart's nodding in an agreement, cannot happen if we don't fund them. So this budget proposes funding. As I tried to outline earlier, local authorities will have to make choices, will have to look at efficiencies naturally. But as I heard in the evidence session earlier, it's not necessarily Scottish Government decisions. It'll be other pressures that the public sector face. That could be uh, pay, that could be other demands on services and so on. But again, that's all within the context of our funding decisions are to allow local authorities to have more resource and the ability in terms of real terms, increase in resource and capital, and local authorities can raise more through council tax. Again, in the context of a £2 billion reduction over the 10-year period and the resource um, a budget uh, that, that we have from uh, the UK uh, a, a government. And as I say, excluding the NHS health consequentials, if I hadn't taken the decisions I'm proposing to take and just applied and photocopied the cuts coming from the Chancellor, it would have been a real terms reduction for local government, not real terms growth as proposed in the budget that I'm presenting uh, to Parliament. Cosler talked about the 400 million new commitments that they are uh, are involved in that. Maybe some of the, the good stories and the new initiatives that they believed were going to be beneficial uh, to their communities and their council areas. So if there is the £400 million of new commitments that the Scottish Government are asking uh, local government to take on board, uh, and the funding package that's there, uh, do, you not real, do you not accept that there will be uh, a shortfall in some areas? I've tried to describe, I appreciate that with the pressures that local authorities face, and I'm actually not, uh, not underestimating that, because it's faced right across the public sector. The problem at source, of course, is a UK government that's continuing austerity. But even with the, with the limited levers that the Scottish Government has at its disposal, we're taking choices to turn that real terms reduction into real terms growth. And we've set out priorities. Some of these priorities I thought the Conservatives shared. For example, there's been campaigns for the extension of free personal care. Frank's Law is being funded as part of this budget. Am I now being told by the Conservatives that we shouldn't be funding that and we shouldn't let that happen? It's been campaigned for, it's in the budget. I could go through each member of the committee with interests that they have that are funded in this budget to suggest I shouldn't fund it and leave it at the total discretion um, of local government it would be somewhat surprising. I suspect I would end up in the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament uh, to have demands made of us on why we didn't provide the funding to deliver uh, the, the commitment. So I accept there are challenges, I accept there are pressures, but what I'm proposing is a real terms increase. What I'm uh, proposing is, 
uh, to ensure that local authorities can raise the, the necessary revenues to deliver their services. And as I say, if I had followed the, the plans from Mr Stewart to deliver a tax cut to the richest in society, the highest earning in society, it wouldn't mean more for local government or anyone else for that matter. It would mean more than half a billion pounds less resource for Scotland's public services if I followed the full advice of Mr um, Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Look, uh, before I let Kenny Gibson and uh, Graham and Alec Rowley have got just, I think, individual questions to ask. Uh, so I've got a question about ad adaptations. Is that, is that okay to ask that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's to, to yourself, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Communities. Um, we wrote to you, as you know, about ad adaptations, um, and in that letter we pointed out that the, 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 the budget had been 10 million for, for some years, uh, but demands uh, had actually uh, outstripped that. Um, so there is a, a growing funding gap uh, for adaptations. Um, uh, and, you, and you replied to us and you um, reiterated it earlier that there are no plans to increase that budget. The budget will remain at 10 million. So isn't the situation just gonna get worse and worse? So we've maintained the adaptation budget at £10 million for RSLs, and those co that covers the 30 local authorities. In addition to that, though, Glasgow and Edinburgh adaptations funding for RSLs is provided through the TMDF budget, and that adds a further, average, on average, another £3 million to that pot provided by the Scottish Government. So um, while the £10 million is the, the, a very explicit line there, there are... There is a, that's not the totality of the pot that's used uh, to fund adaptations. Now, what we do agree with uh, in terms of the suggestions made by, for instance, like this uh, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and their evidence to you uh, for better alignment between people who need an adapted pot property and the allocation of void properties and that's why um, in my recent correspondence I think with uh, Mr Dorn and the, our, my officials are working on a review of existing legislation and guidance in relation to adaptations because I think there's probably a bit of complexity there that's probably unnecessary and in the attempt to try and corral that, coordinate that, make sure that it's very much more focused on the individual needs of a person, then there's, I think there's a much more work that we need to do. So there had already been work and pilots uh, in place, and I understand that one of the ones that's um, making some good progress around how you uh, coordinate that adaptation pot of money much better is the Scottish Borders. So there is work ongoing that has been ongoing to try and test out how we can use that, um, that funding in a better way. And that's what I mean as well around the taking real cognizance of what the committee have told us in their letter to me and why we've made the decision to maintain the budget at 10 million, but certainly with a, along with that, a commitment to ensure that we look at this a bit more, uh, a bit more carefully about how we maximize the impact of that money, which is not just found in that 10 million pound line, but in other parts of the, uh, in public life as well. So I think that's why I think I valued the committee's work on this and the committee's just letter to me because it en enables us to uh, maybe put more pace into that work that is quite necessary and clearly necessary from the evidence you got from the uh, the housing uh, so the Scottish Federation of Housing Association. I hope Sorry, that uh, you mean, we'll continue to keep you updated on that because yeah, I understand yeah. and realise and recognise your very very keen interest in this. It's it, I can't it was October that you hired some of that evidence um, and it's been an ongoing issue that I think has been raised by the committee uh, over a number of uh, months and there is progress to, to demonstrate movement on this but I think the £10 million plus the the, the further um, money, uh, money that's been put through to Glasgow and Edinburgh through the TMDF budget line uh, and the IJB responsibility I think there's a need to make sure that we're seeing demonstrable change now that the IGBs are there in place with uh, some uh, policy lead on that. Yeah, I, I, I think as a committee, as you know, it's been an ongoing piece of work. Um, so I think we would need to be uh, assured on an ongoing basis that things are improving. Um, and I would absolutely agree, I think. And, and I think, again, that's why we wrote back to the committee in the way that we did to make sure that we maintained the budget line, but that but didn't lose sight of the fact that there was ongoing need to explore the totality of that landscape uh, to, to coordinate it in a better way to enable us all 
and local authorities and RSLs to focus on the individual needs of the person so that the, that's the motivating driver uh, in how we get the adaptations for people's houses. But of course, alongside that kind of goes back to the, the question that I had from Alec Rowley earlier on around making sure that we build houses that are more easily adaptable or are fit for purpose from the outset. So uh, that work on the adaptations alongside the ongoing work, existing work to make sure the houses that we're building now um, can be uh, adaptable, but also the, the house building projects that we take forward post-2021, that those are a uh, much more understanding of demographic changes and the need to make sure that we are building houses of good quality that are adaptable to the changing needs of our population. So I think looking at that at that in the whole is, is important as well. Yeah. And perhaps you can uh, keep us informed about Absolutely, the, happy the, to do the, so. Yeah, the uh, review. Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Alan? You said earlier, Finance Secretary, that, that you know you could talk about your last two budgets and, and the, the real term increase in them. Uh, I, I met some council leaders earlier this week, and one of them told me that they were planning a number of scenarios, and one of them was based on your last two budgets where you announced the settlement for local government. There was then negotiations with other parties, and I think last year was an additional £35 million went in for local government and they were working on the scenario if that happens this year what would it mean for them uh, is there more money on the table is there an opportunity for other parties to come to you and negotiate like you have done the last two years further further monies going into the local government settlement that's a very good question convener and, and it, it's if it's a serious invitation to ask is my door open to to other uh, parties in parliament to, to be serious and come and meet with me uh, to discuss how a budget might progress i would welcome that uh, but it's not um in all seriousness um uh, a reflection of the labor party or some other party's current approach to me in terms of uh, the budget positioning so if a party wishes to come to me with ideas and a credible plan as to how we could uh, amend the budget. I am open to such uh, engagement. I've said that consistently. I recognise we're a minority government. Uh, I would require uh, the support of another party to get the budget through Parliament. That, that's not news, uh, uh, a minority government, and I am open to that engagement. But I should say, and I hope I reflected this earlier, um, in terms of uh, the uh, fiscal flexibility I have, it is very limited because I've tried to set out a budget that Parliament can support by, as I say, uh, putting resource towards the commitments that Parliament's asked us to make, also seen through the government's programme for government, uh, and ensuring that we can provide stability, sustainability for our public services and any economic stimulus as well, because that's, that's for the good of the country and the good, ultimately, of, of um, uh, revenues. Um, so I don't have much fiscal headroom left, no, but am I willing to engage with other... Um, political parties to enable the, the passage of the bill, yes. The reason that's important is it's not just what a political party may seek by way of concession or amendment, but the risk of the budget going down is the difference of some £2 billion. And everything we were discussing earlier, £826 million just for housing, for example, that members have touched upon, or the, the sum for free personal care, or the 700-odd million pounds increase for the NHS is all at risk if a budget doesn't pass. So I think for that reason, every opposition party should take the opportunity to engage with me seriously. And I have to say some opposition parties are not doing that, whether it's a constitutional obsession or what, I don't know. Um, but other parties are maybe not taking the budget process as seriously as they should, because this is, you know, if members are true to their word, this is about the jobs and services and people of Scotland that we're talking about. That's why the budget's so important. Do I have much fiscal headroom? I say again, no, I don't. I've described the position in terms of uh, the last reporting uh, uh, figure around uh, reserves. I've proposed in the budget how the budget is funded. I don't have much room for manoeuvre, but I'm happy to engage with any political party to see how we can find the necessary compromise to allow that £2 billion extra expenditure, as currently proposed, be realised for Scotland's public sector, uh, for Scotland's uh, country, and to make the, the necessary progress that I'm sure we all share. I say, convener, people shouldn't play games with this budget. I think of all times the country needs stability and certainty right now and I think that the chaos that's um, unfolding in Westminster is an absolute disgrace, an abdication of duty by the UK government and this parliament should show itself to be the uh, competent, reasonable and socially minded place that it is and was built to be. 
Thank you very much. On that note, I'll pass you on to Kenny Gibson. Thank you very much, convener and finance, uh, finance secretary. I just wonder if you could share my uh, bewilderment, actually, that we've heard a lot of evidence from COSO this morning and questions from colleagues around the table have expressed a number of concerns about the budget, but no one uh, has put any numbers on the additional funding that they think should go to local government this year, or indeed how that should be sourced, whether it's from taxation, from other areas of the Scottish budget, or we did hear some undefined, rather woolly um, suggestions about additional levers. I don't know how they would be introduced in the time we have before the, the budget comes in. I'm just wondering if a, a, any other political parties, or indeed COSL itself, have come to you with any specific numbers, if there are, or if they're being as coy with you as they have been uh, today? Not as yet, convener, to be uh, transparent uh, with a uh, committee. Um, in, uh, I know there's been some reference to the negotiations uh, with COSLA. COSLA set out their asks in relation to social care, and I surpassed their asks in relation to the pressures that they were experiencing around social care. A figure was offered, and I went beyond that in terms of uh, the proposed support around the line on social care, for example. Um, a, in the public domain, uh, the Greens have, have, have described a position around uh, meaningful reform and local taxation. That's in the public domain. Uh, but um, as it stands, I don't have a, a specific figure as to what a budget amendment would look like. I understand other parties have described their position. Um, you know, I've, I've seen from the Conservatives that uh, they haven't set out a figure of increased resources for local governments. It's hardly a surprise when the position of Conservatives is a tax cut, essentially, of over a half a billion pounds to, to match uh, the UK position just on in income tax. So I do not have a specific quantum that's been asked for by, by, by other parties. I would, of course, respect that negotiation if that was offered up privately through any discussions I would have with um, uh, parties. But no, I don't have an alternative budget proposal uh, as it stands from, as the member has requested, Kenny Gibson has requested from another political party or indeed from COSLA. And are there any additional powers that could be delivered this side of the budget? Um, because we heard from COSLA um, requests of more flexibility in terms of powers, which really means an ability to obviously raise more funds from the people who live in their specific areas, I would imagine. Um, I've said uh, that I, I'm actually open to discussion on uh, local discretion, local taxation, to uh, individual ideas, but they have to be raised with the Scottish Government in a serious and credible way. If it requires legislation, then it will require the necessary process uh, to legislate. Uh, Mr Gibson will be aware that uh, the government has no plans for what's described as a tourist tax or a, a transient visitor levy, but we are conducting a national discussion, a national conversation in that regard. Um, but I have asked where, a, 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 whether it's parties or COSLA or anyone else, if they have a proposition about a levy or a tax, so on and so forth, that they, they bring the detail to me. And that offer is still open to... Uh, all in Scottish politics. And, uh, you know, does he, well, we heard today from um, Gail McGregor, uh, who said, um, and I quote, local authorities in England and Wales are collapsing, uh, given the funding reductions that are taking place. Does, does he therefore find it extraordinary that uh, Tory colleagues are castigating the, the Scottish Government over local government funding, while at the same time uh, supporting a UK government that has both cut Scotland's budget and is eviscerating local government south of the border? Well, indeed, I would agree with that characterisation. It's more as do as we say, not as we do, where the Tories are in office and I've highlighted earlier uh, the position that we've protected uh, local government in a way that local government has not been protected south of the border. In fact, our, our um, uh, protection is, is better than is the case in Wales as well. A uh, share of the budget as proposed is continuing to be at 27%. And I think some of the elements of capital have to be particularly welcome because surely members welcome the town centre fund of £50 million. I've, surely every community uh, would welcome that, for example, in the, the real terms increase in, in resource. So I think there is a very interesting contrast between what's happening south of the border and what's happening in Scotland. The only member I understand who did welcome um, the £50 million after the budget statement was me, actually, who did ask a, a question about that, um, you know, <laughs> which was one you were not expecting, I understand. But anyway, mo mo moving on, um, in terms of um, um, 
like for like was raised by COSLA. They say that, you know, like for like, um, the Scottish government reduced local government's share of the budget. But given the fact that the NHS has a host of new procedures, you know, whether it's uh, surgical, whether it's new medicines that have come out, etc., etc., and indeed is dealing with 25% more A&E cases than they were only five years ago, is it not the case that the like for like has shifted in the NHS quite considerably as well as the local government? That, that's convenient a fair analysis. And again, I tried to describe that earlier when we have a, a commitment to pass on the Barnett consequentials in relation to health resource. We have been doing Doing that, and that then uh, gives something of an explanation around share of the budget. But local government, uh, as I say, I have I have maintained local government's share of the budget, a uh, 27 percent, and um, uh, over the period, I think local government has been treated very fairly. And I have turned real terms reduction to Scotland's resource block grant still into real terms growth to local government. So surely by that analysis, that's a fair settlement uh, for. Uh, local government, notwithstanding the challenges that the, all of the public sector faces, but they're not in isolation to local government. That's right across the public sector. Um, but we have commitments around the NHS. If another political party in this parliament has an alternative plan about funding the National Health Service substantially less to give another part of the public sector, for example, substantially more, then say so. But our proposition is to give the uplift uh, to the National Health Service, as I've described in the budget of over £700 million, passing on the consequentials, making up for the shortfall, uh, quite an underhanded uh, shortfall at the hands of the Tories as well. They promised so much for Scotland's National Health Service and then underdelivered. Um, the Scottish Government's budget makes up that shortfall by £50 million, whilst at the same time allows more resources for local government in real terms. That's why I think it's a fair settlement. And if I'd simply replicated the cuts from the Chancellor, local government would have been in a much worse position. NHS would be £53.5 million once, uh, worse off. Just one other thing, though, and it's not something that's been touched on, but you'll know all about it because I've been raising it for the last four years uh, within the political party of which we are both uh, members. Um, and that is the issue of uh, radical reform of the public sector. Is it not about time the Scottish Government looked at much more radical reforms of, uh, of the public sector? For example, Fife uh, is coterminous uh, local authority with the NHS, and yet it's got a it's got an integrated joint board, a local authority and a health board. Would it not be better, rather than have a tug of war between uh, the council and, uh, and all the bureaucracy that entails and the, the health board to look seriously at perhaps merging um, the health board and the local authority, the local authority so you have one uh, democratic structure um, which would reduce bureaucracy and allow um, greater transparency and indeed more resources to go to the front line. And of course, as you know, I've got proposals for other parts of Scotland or, or, uh, of a similar nature. But I'm just thinking, uh, w w w you know, the Greens, I'm not sure what they're proposing in terms of reform in term, uh, about uh, having more funding control. But in my view, the structure of local government and any, uh, well, the public sector in Scotland needs much more radical reform. And is it not about time the Scottish government looked very seriously at this, whether it decides to go forward with it or not is, is another thing, but should at least be uh, examining this. Otherwise, this time next year, we'll be having exactly the same debate. Um, as we are we're having at the moment. It's part of the budget process. <coughs> well, it's well, because it's all a bit more efficient feel, feel use of public to, money. To answer, if you uh, the good news is, convener, is Miss Campbell's desperate to take on this question <laughs> <laughs> as community secretary with lead role for the local governance thread review. As to the question, should we achieve public service reform, transformation, efficiencies through how, how we design services and focus on outcomes? Of course, I entirely agree. We don't want to waste resource on unnecessary boundary disputes, power struggles or anything else. However, there is a live uh, engagement going on right now to try and achieve those, those kind of outcomes and the Cabinet Secretary it leads on that, so I think it's right that I defer to, to Ms Campbell. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and I think it's not, a, it's not a new concept either. I think you know, these are some of the things that you talk around, maybe not um, as explicitly as some of the suggestions you outlined, but certainly some of the issues that Campbell Christie challenged us to, to examine with his report in 2011 around that wider reform, about making sure that we have people at the centre of, of decision-making, that we empower our communities. Uh, and I guess that's very much the, um, 
the focus of the local governance review, which um, has very recently closed the, the, the its consultation, and my officials are currently looking at the analysis of what people have suggested they think would be the way in which the governance of Scotland should should look like. Um, so if you've not had a chance to take part in that consultation, certainly there's still ch opportunity to make sure that your, your views are fed into that. But certainly the, uh, there has been a wide range of people engaged in that around some of those things about why, what, what power could be further devolved, what powers and from what body or from what entity should be uh, further devolved to communities, um, or is the power balance the right one at the current time? Uh, and I think you know some of that will allow us to pursue some of the issues that you've raised around coterminous boundaries, making sure that our public entities work far better together, that there's not that, that wrestling around who's in charge of what and whose budget and why that's my, my budget and you can't touch that. I think that's the reality of where we want to go is to make sure that we get to that place where we can uh, move community plan and partnerships further forward so that they have a uh, much more um, uh, ability to work together to, to make better decisions for the communities that they serve, putting them at the front of decision making as opposed to having um, and disregarding their own boundaries uh, as whether they're the NHS or whether it's local government or whatever entity it is. So I think there's there's opportunity to do more of what you've described through the local governance review and we've not ruled out legislation if that's required. Community planning partnerships, yet another layer that nobody knows what, what they do in terms of the general public. I mean, mm -hmm. at the time for tinkering is really over. We do need radical reform of, local, of, of uh, public sector if we're going to be able to deliver for the people we represent. Raising your uh, consultation. I've been pushing submission. it for four years. Okay. I, um, I won't go in any further to <laughs> internal right. machinations. Yes, yes, that, that would, that would be nice. is something we need much. to address. Okay, uh, listen. Thank you both very much, and everybody else who came along with you. That was that was very helpful indeed. Uh, and I now conclude the public part of the meeting. Thank you.